uh, this year the theme is uh, forest restoration a part to recovery and well being and uh, i would like to also tell a little bit about the andaman islanders book uh, a study in social anthropology it was published by cambridge in the year 1922 the book has uh, 504 pages I, i don't want to go in detail into the book but that work is considered as uh, the classical anthropogen uh, ethnography of the andaman islanders the book contains information on social organization ceremony religious magical belief mythology material culture and in addition redcliff brown includes a functional interpretation of the custom belief in and people of in that book and the final portion of the book uh, in part uh, attempts to deduce something about the archaic culture of the andaman island comparing their material culture with that of similar people elsewhere so this is uh, why we are here uh, for both the reason hopefully both this aspect will be touched upon by the moderator and the panelists during the course of their presentation and subsequent discussion today uif is collaborating with another historic department of anthropology in india department of anthropology university of lucknow we all know that the department had a glorious past i extend my heartfelt thanks to the department for agreeing to our proposal to collaborate with us in this today's colloquium yeah has already collaborated with eight uh, prestigious anthropology department in the country uh, delhi university calcutta university hyderabad university utkal university sambalpur university harisingh gaur viswavidyalaya sabitri bai phule university and the forum is just uh, uh, you will be surprised to know four months old kindly request your colleagues scholar and student to join the forum by visiting our website Uh, that is anthropologyindiaforum.org uh, i would like to hand over this uh, platform to uh, professor sa uh, professor vijay sir thank you very much professor behra and uh, has given um, about uh, he has talked about uh, this one forestry day as well as the publication of um, rachri brown's book andaman islanders in uh, in 1921 so i don't need to explain anything in that now <clears throat> shri avaradi i think he has spent most of the time of his life in andaman nicobar and that too mostly among the tribes of andaman nicobar <clears throat> other aboriginal tribes of andaman also have been studied by him like the andamanis the onge the jarwa and andaman islands where he studied uh, working as as a uh, director of the tribal welfare and daman and nicobar administration well i welcome you sir your topic uh, you have suggested me the topic that uh, the changing tribal situation in andaman and nicobar archipelago in the 21st century thank you professor sahai and uh, at the outset let me congratulate the organizers of this virtual uh, seminar colloquium virtual colloquium at this point of time these people the organizers like professor deepak behra the president of united and uh, indian anthropological forum secretary of the forum professor gregory and other members of the forum and it is very interesting that the organizers have chosen a theme which says that the affairs of tribes of andaman and nicobar archipelago in 21st century it is really commendable initiative taken by the organizers and in particular professor sahai who has done a seminal work in the nicobar islands and i am here to lay my hands on his recent publication the experiencing anthropology so i would like to read also and i am also aware that he is going to pen um, very interesting account of the 
book on the Andaman Islands and their the tribes and the fate of the tribes. We are all waiting to see your books, Professor Sahai. The theme that you have chosen is really encompassing. We heard that the Ministry of Tribal Affairs or Home Affairs or Foreign Affairs. The affairs of the tribes of Andaman Nicobar Islands in the 21st century is really a critical one because the present century is going to be a, a determining age for the aboriginal tribes of these islands. Before we uh, talk about the present century, in passing, I would like to mention about the earlier ones as well, because these are all also not uh, lesser importance or are of no less eventful. In fact, the history of the tribes of Andaman Islands goes back to 30,000 years when the first wave of the human beings started migrating from the Africa and uh, sprang across the globe. And it is believed that the Andaman Islanders are supposed to be the first wave among the first wave of the uh, human beings who evolved in Africa and then spread across. And thereafter, the history began and for long 30,000 years, the Andaman Islanders or the Aboriginal tribes, what we call, were the sole inhabitants of these far-flung islands. Since there were no other outsiders except for the occasional visitors like Malayas, Burmese or Chinese, Voyagers who used to come to only to capture some of the aborigines and take away them as a slaves to their own countries. And precisely because of that mm. reason that the aboriginal tribes of these islands are believed to adopt a hostile attitude towards all outsiders. So before the uh, outsiders came, that is the mid 19th century with the arrival of the penal settlement the age or the period of the aboriginal tribes could be described as a golden age and this was the period where during which they prospered and lived happily and it was only in the mid 19th century that is 1858 when the british established the penal settlement in the andaman islands it was like a, a bull in the china shop and from then onwards, the downfall of the various tribes in the Andaman Islands began. To start with, it was the Andamanese, which was the largest tribe uh, in the number, supposed to be more than 5,000 or 8,000, who resisted the penal settlers in the Andaman Islands. They um, continued to raid the settlements. They wanted to article, exterminate the settlements here because the when the settlers came and landed here, settlers in the sense that penal settlers, the first thing what they did was to slash or clear the forest. And the forest, as you know, the livelihood, the entire livelihood of the aborigines. So they thought that these are the enemies because their resistance was at at the at the stake because their food, everything else, all endowments were at risk. So therefore, they started attacking them. And there was a pitched battle, which is well known in the history as the Battle of Aberdeen, and which unfortunately was lost to the British, because the bows and arrows of the Andamanese could not stand the artillery and the gunpowder of the British. And in fact, they would have won the battle, but for the uh, one traitor called Dudha Tiwari. The story is well known to everybody. The, the, the idea of the Andamanese was to attack 
the settlement in the early hours of the uh, 17th May 1859, so that the all the settlers, all the penal settlers were asleep, and it would have been easy prey for their even arrows. But the Dudna Tiwari escaped from the Andamanese who really had been there or living with them, who escaped from the penal settlement and lived with them and married the Andamanese girl and came to the uh, British officers and warned or, or informed them there is an ambush going to be taken place by the Andamanese. So the British mustered their all resources and there was a pitched battle and uh, in that the uh, Andamanese were killed. So thereafter, the Andamanese uh, became, you know, uh, become nervous rather and later subsequently the British established a notorious uh, play or the institution called the Andamanese home or the Andaman home where the Andamanese were invited to come and live there and they were given present gifts and it is this place that the, the whole thing started. Means they were introduced to the OPM, the leaker and even their women folk were, you know, uh, abused. And that is how they started the, uh, what is called the birth of the mulattoes and all that. So that was the story of the Andamanese. And whereas the other tribes like the Jarwas, Sentinelis, and the, uh, of course, Wongis also were defeated later, uh, these two tribes continued to be hostile to outsiders, the even in the settlement. It was in 1885 the uh, Wongis also gave up their hostility because they were also defeated in a battle by the British in 1867 in the Little Andaman Island. And Jarwas, of course, continued their hostility to outsiders and Sentinelis as also. Since the uh, 20th century, in the 20th century, uh, the administration or the government started the you know, refugee settlements in the Andaman Islands, the displaced persons were brought here to settle in the various major islands. Then there was a need to, you know, befriend the hostile tribes, including Jarwas in particular. So there used to be a system of, you know, organizing the uh, contact missions to establish a friendly relations with. And because of these efforts in 1974, the Jarwas were befriended. Uh, on the western coast of the Andaman Islands. But these Jarwas both became friendly to the contact uh, expedition team, but they remained hostile to the outsiders or the other settlers and all that. And that is how this, this whole story continued till the, uh, towards till the end of the uh, last century, that 20th century. Similarly, in, this, in the case of the, you know, Sentinelis, they were also, you know, uh, they were also attempts to what call befriend them, though there was no absolute need to befriend them because the Sentinelese occupied a separate island and they were, I mean, that island was not open for the rehabilitation of the displaced persons. But however, the government policy was to what call organize a contact expeditions. Accordingly, uh, these were also conducted to, towards the Sentinel Island. So, in, from 1988, when I joined as a director of tribal welfare, um, I also continued the same policy of, you know, same system of organizing the contact expeditions. We continued for long three years. A, a different pattern was, you know, established. Earlier, the expeditions used to be organized in such a way that the, the, the expedition members used to what to call, try to land on the uh, shores of the North Sentinel Island and try to pick up some things or the you know, belongings of the Sentinelis and they used to come out. And they thought that whoever comes and land there are the enemies because they come there to pick up their belongings. But what we did for uh, during, last, uh, during the three years period was that we'll go near the island in a lifeboat and keep observing and give the uh, drop the gifts of the coconuts and all that to flow to the floor to the shore and we keep observing them and we took care that no one will land on the seashore so that a confidence is built that these people there are group of people who come here occasionally once in a month or on a full moon day or so they come and give something which is ed edible but they knew about the coconut as a uh, thing which can be eaten so they thought that this is a group which comes to give something and they were not interested at all to harm them so after three years of the continuous effort in, in the, uh, 
1991 january 4 uh, as usual they they will went there and in the earlier occasions they used to come down to the sea shore after seeing the big boat that where we used to sail to the north sentinel island they used to come down to the shore with the bows and arrows on the 4th of uh, you know uh, january 1991 i could see that the arrows i mean the sentinel is came down to the shores without the bows and arrows and that was a clear indication that probably they are intended not to at all you know uh, have a uh, in the hostel to towards the party so we mustered the courage to go nearer and uh, by then the sentinels came uh, in their own canoes and uh, we could i could see that they were not uh, um, having any weapons in the sense that bows and arrows and i landed on the sea shore on the uh, deep water and the uh, one young sentinelist boy came across and took the coconut from my hand that was the first contact expedition with the sentinelist on the 4th of january 1991 and this continued for next two years and then then we felt i felt that see, it is not a good uh, thing to continue so i took personal uh, initiative to what to call move a file with the administration that there is no purpose served by continuing with the the contact activations we said that uh, this should be dis- uh, i mean not discontinued because as the uh, others come to know that the sentinel is are friendly the fishermen and all that other people will go and uh, you know exploit them so we decided that the administration uh, opened uh, the or agreed the suggestion and uh, the contact activation system was what to call um, cancelled or what to call um, uh what uh, was stopped thereafter they became uh, hostile and uh, any 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 uh, ventures by any others were all to call repulsed or in fact uh, they were uh, many of the people of the two fishermen in 19 uh, 2016 were killed when they tried to land on that and the latest one is 2018 when the uh, american um, uh, what to call uh, person uh, john chow was uh, killed there on the sea shore because he attempted to land there so this was the story of the uh, sentinels now coming to the uh, 21st century 21st century uh, before the 21st century uh, opens the jarwas you know uh, there was an episode called you know nme nme episode the jarwa boy who was uh, you know picked up from the uh, kadamtala area because he had a bone fracture and he was treated in the gbp hospital for nearly 6 months and later on he was released in their territory with all gifts and all that and uh, the rest of the people in the among the darwas must have thought that this fellow is dead and gone but when they when they saw him coming back to their own territory with some kind of a uh, gift they thought it was a very uh, uh, wonderful or a nice thing and it took one complete year for the this boy uh and uh, may to probably convince the rest of the people that the settlers or other people who are living on the other side are not really enemies so uh, one day the, he mustered a courage and he caught another group of uh, young boys and uh, you know reached the jetty of kadamtala or the uttara jetty and uh, you know that is how the uh, he established a friendly or the attitude towards the outsiders so that was the beginning of i could say that Uh, you know it is the downfall of the uh, darwas because then they when they became friendly they became susceptible to the any other these things within a year or so there were epidemics like the measles and all that so we uh, the administration controlled and all that so that was the uh, towards the 1998 99 and there came the on the 21st century that is the 21st century began with the uh, tsunami which you know changed the entire you know landscape or entire story of the andaman islands particularly the islanders and it was the nicobaris who were over the worst affected because uh, the uh, the tsunami destroyed the settlements which were there along the sea shore and their you know mainstay of the economy that was the coconut groves and all that were destroyed and many about 3500 people were killed in the tsunami and later on they were you know uh, rehabilitated on the interior and the relief operations continued for a rather long period for five years or so and during the relief period or the relief operations they were given all uh, free items and uh, uh, certain you know 
modern item, modern items like you know lpg gas was given to them mineral water was introduced to them and uh, various other things were also introduced to them as a part of their relief operations and a uh, huge amount of uh, you know uh, relief was also given as ex gracia i mean apart from that the the administration or the government decided that you know to take up the large scale developmental activities in the andaman islands to to overcome the you know destruction of the tsunami and that's how it led to the a lot of uh, activities including trading and the commerce and all that and with that came the uh, the system of you know the 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 tourism which has come in a big way to andaman islands and the tourism how it is affecting the the garwas and other people is a story which is to be you know studied separately so uh, these are a long story how the uh, the 21st century will Im- impact on the aboriginal tribes of the andaman nicobar islands but i would only conclude by saying that the andaman islands have become now the hot spots for our today the andaman islands andaman nicobar islands were known as the uh, for their uh, you know biodiversity hot spots but now the andaman islands or the andaman islanders have also become the ethnographic hot spots there is a urgent need to have a multi disciplinary study led by the anthropologist to study various aspects of the aboriginal tribes there are very interesting things about the tribes which is to be what the documented and which is not only for their own good it is for the for the good of the others for example even for the survival also there is a need to what to call carry out the uh, health research particularly i give only one little example before i conclude uh, the you know um, uh, anemia is quite common among the aboriginal tribes here the doctors you know sometime uh, get panicky or you know they can they start what to call wondering when the a jarwa boy or a wongi boy their um, hb level falls to even uh, two or three uh, mg in the other communities three uh, mg uh, hb means it is a highly risky and in the the child would not probably survive so the doctors will get panicky and they start intervening into the various uh, the aggressive methods but this jarwa boy or the uh, ongi boy with the three uh, mg hb remains or almost like a normal so once the uh, senior doctor from the armed forces had come i raised this issue how is that the boy with this or the children with this uh, uh, level can continue with their normal activities then i said that probably the standards that the standards which have been worked out or the who standard worked out for other communities may not be appropriate for these hunters and gatherers for example other community this is seven or 6 will be a very dangerous thing but even the 3 mg is not so dangerous support to be seen dangerous to the sentin uh, your uh, wongis and animals so i suggested that there is a need probably to uh, study or fix the separate standards for the uh, aboriginal tribes like andaman islands there are many other issues which the anthropologists are supposed to what to study that's how there are um, A, a list of the things can be studied, which we can discuss subsequently or later on. Thank you, professors, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. A very good afternoon to all of you, uh, and uh, uh, I am very thankful to Professor Vijay Sahai sir uh, for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, platform, and I am also thankful to uh, UAEF and its office bearers, especially. uh dear deepak behra sir and uh, uh agrigari sir and my name is sashi kumar uh, i am working in anthropological survey of india uh, as uh, as joint director and uh, i have been served in andaman uh since uh, 2011 and uh, now also uh, uh we are uh, doing uh, nsi as part of nsi research we are doing some projects in andaman and i agreed that i will speak about uh, the sentinelis as we all know uh, there are uh, six uh, tribal communities uh, uh, aboriginal communities in andaman and out of them uh, five are the particularly vulnerable tribal groups uh, five are the uh, particularly vulnerable uh, tribal groups but all these five different tribal groups uh, uh, were at uh, uh, and uh, they are at uh, 
different stages of uh, they have during the historical period they have undergone uh, different uh, different types of exposures and experiences and the, all the five are now living in uh, five uh, different islands uh, with uh, and not, uh, not in a contact situation uh, with each other and their exposure to other tribal community uh, other people of uh, andaman who have been settled there later on are also at a different degree but uh, as we all know that the sentinelese uh, uh, they are the uh, least uh, exposed or uh, or still uh, uh, is in our terms uh, very unfriendly and least exposed to outsiders and they were not in the limelight till uh, 2018 because uh, uh, unlike the jarawas and the other communities they were not in a contact situation with other tribal communities so they were not in the limelight since the uh, the november uh, 2018 incident have happened uh, actually uh, it was in uh, 1771 uh, the british uh, uh, surveyor john ritchie uh, he identified this uh, island while uh, surveying the uh, the uh, andaman islands uh, he saw a lot of lights there and he named the island as a uh, north sentinel and that is the uh, uh, that is how the name got to that it is uh, the history there are historical as well as geographical and economic reasons why they have been uh, kept alone or they have been uh, uh, left them alone uh, without much contact uh, both during the colonial and uh, post colonial uh, period The Sentinel Island is a, is a very small island, uh, about uh, 60 square kilometer uh, land area, uh, located uh, uh, southwest of uh, 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 Port Blair, and it's uh, very near to Port Blair, about 60 kilometers, and it is also uh, uh, very near from uh, the uh, Wando, one of the uh, famous uh, tourism destination today, about 36 kilometer away. Since it's a very small island, the Britishers, uh, the colonial administration, were not having Uh, much uh, uh, economic or uh, commercial interest uh, uh, in the island so uh, because it's a very uh, small island that's why more or less they uh, kept them uh, alone but it was only the uh, yomi portman who was in charge of uh, the uh, the andaman home an institution established by the british uh, after the second uh, settlement uh, to uh, to be friend the Uh, ab aboriginal communities there uh, portman was in charge of it uh, for uh, since uh, 1818 he made uh, many attempts to uh, attempts to contact them. it is from the records of the mb port the sporadic reports of mb portman as well as the uh, the post colonial uh, contact expedition teams uh, uh, narratives and as well as uh, uh, we uh, we have we have cured uh, some sort of information on this topic and i myself also have got uh, a few opportunities to uh, visit uh, visit the island but of course uh, there is uh, uh, avradi sahib is the he's the a champion of the uh, this uh, centralist contact but uh, uh, so he might be having a lot of experiences to narrate but uh, even then uh, i'll be uh, uh, take in some time to tell my experiences and to uh, see the house uh, and to see the situation so during the colonial period uh, as i told earlier the portman have made many attempts to uh, to land uh, once he landed the uh, not once many times he landed the and once he could even he was even successful in uh, bringing uh, uh, some of them to port blair and in that incident the one old couple was the they uh, they have been died and the So the children uh, the young children they were sent them back to the island with lot of gifts but the tactics of uh, administration the tactic was always to uh, uh, to befriend the uh, aboriginal communities the to catch some of them bring them to the port blair and treat them well and uh, leave them back with a lot of gifts that was the tactics adopted by the british uh, colonial administration uh, uh, to befriend these tribal groups it was uh, more or less successful among the and the money strike and and uh, to date extent among the ongi also but it failed miserably among the jarawas as well as the sentinels but in the case of jarawas uh, they were uh, in contact situation with the settlement 
they were also in contact situation with the later uh, uh, later uh, settlers they who have been uh, brought uh, brought and settled in andaman like the different uh, groups of people like the mapelas the karens the uh, uh, the, uh, the and the other different groups of people uh, brought because they were in the, uh, the great andaman uh, uh, island so they were always in contact situation and there was a lot of narratives on the uh, the, the jarawa incidents the, the interface between the jarawas and the others will always they used to term it as a jarawa incident that is where they were in the limelight as in the national and the international media uh, attracted much attention on them but the sentinelists were uh, aloof they were away from uh, away from uh, the main main island and they were isolated in a small a small island where the uh, uh, british administration were not having much commercial interest of course uh, mr portman has mentioned that he was having some uh, idea of uh, developing a coconut plantation there as yes, the land is very fertile and favorable for the favorable for the coconut plantation but after portman the british administrators uh, uh, administrators followed him they didn't show much interest to uh, to uh, be friend them or to contact uh, keep in contact with them that is why they uh, they remained uh, more or less uh, more or less uh, isolated during the colonial period in the post colonial period in the early 50s uh, lidio cipriani the italian anthropologist he tried he made an attempt to land there but it was not successful and later he uh, went to uh, little uh, little andaman and he worked among the among the pomge communities but it was in 1967 uh, when uh, 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 Mahavir Singh became the uh, chief commissioner of the Andaman Islands. He uh, took the uh, initiative to visit the island. His idea was to the the uh, the reach of the administration should reach every nook and corner of the islands. That was his idea. As part of the, he uh, taken the first attempt, uh, first initiative in the post uh, colonial period to visit the uh, Sentinel Island. he and his team with a uh, lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, police and uh, other accompanions and the great andamanis uh, tribes they landed there and uh, they could that time they could uh, uh, they landed in the island they uh, walked into the forest and they have uh, of course without the uh, permission and with the without the consent and without the knowledge they collected a lot of material cultural objects uh, during that visit and they brought it to the port prayer and it is in the different museums there and these material cultural objects from these material cultural objects and the observation made by the uh, 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 team at that point of time uh, from those uh, material cultural objects uh, we and, and as well as from the sporadic uh, reports of the uh, 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 mv portman and as uh, we could we could uh, Uh, understand a lot uh, we could compare the uh, um, uh, culture to great extent with the other uh, communities of the uh, communities of the island and after 1967 the uh, and especially after the 1969 one uh, when one committee was appointed by the government of india is known as the sundaram committee the sundaram committee also recommended that uh, there should be a a very regular uh, regular uh, gift dropping our uh, uh, gift dropping exercises visits to these islands in, uh, in our effort to be friend them so and uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, interesting uh, recommendation of the committee was that to uh, we have to make them uh, we have to make them uh, 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 dependent on the administration a, 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 a sort of dependency to be evolved in order uh, in order to, uh, in order to make our easier the Uh, is our access to these uh, communities after uh, as per, uh, after this recommendation of the this sundara committee report uh, administration have taken initiative to visit this uh, visit the sentinel island uh, uh, regularly and uh, several uh, several visits have taken place uh, between uh, 1969 and uh, till 1994 several visits have taken place and from this the narratives of the uh, experiences of the the, the contact contact team we also uh, the we also could get a lot of information on 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 this uh, uh, tribal community 
So yeah, then the, uh, as uh, our Adi sir has already talked in his uh, uh, in his speech, in the it was in the year 1991, the historic uh, the contact situ uh, uh, the historic uh, moment of uh, they could establish a contact uh, with the Sandinist tribe. But even then, at that point of time also, in the year 1991, they really, uh, the Sentinelese came to the boards of the boards of the uh, conduct team and they received the uh, coconuts and other gift items from their hands. There was a hand-to-hand -hand conduct at that in the year 1991. And uh, yes, of course, uh, he was the one of the, the, he was the leader of that uh, team and they established a, a contact. But during that time also, the, uh, the the conduct team never attempted to land uh, in the island. They were giving in the in the uh, in the what the conduct was in the water only. They came near to the boats and uh, they received uh, uh, gift items from them. And after ninety one, after ninety four, the there was a real uh, rethinking in the, in the uh, different in the administration's mindset. But uh, what should be the future uh, if the uh, tribe is coming into contact with the uh, uh, mainstream. The, uh, uh, mainstream. Now, what should be the strategy they have to be followed? That was a big question mark in front of the uh, administration. That made them to uh, made them to uh, uh, stop the entire uh, the contact mission exercises thereafter. So after 1994, there was not many uh, visits to the island, and in 2004 and 5 after the the tsunami uh, there was a contact uh, uh, some uh, they visited the island they made a contact uh, but they have uh, uh, circumnavigated the island they assessed the situation there and in the year 2014 uh, there was a forest fire the, they broken out a forest fire some of the uh, uh, local fishermen reported this to the um, brought to the notice of the administration and they that period they made a contact team and uh, for, I was also a member of a, that uh, contact team. And I also uh, could get an opportunity to visit the island in 2004, uh, uh, twice in 2014. So their contact uh, uh, and in the 2018 that the, the incident happened, that is the, when the uh, John Allen Chow, the American, uh, the American uh, landed, the, he was uh, shot killed by the uh, tribe. But it was not the first incident of killing encounter and killing the in the year 1996 itself uh, the three uh, convicts who have escaped from the settlement when they uh, accidentally uh, one of them accidentally landed into the sentinel island and they have been killed by the islanders and in the year 2006 uh, another incident happened two of the uh, uh, fish, local fishermen uh, sundar raj and tiwari also uh, while fishing uh, uh, accidentally drifted to the island and they have been and they have been killed so this is third incident of uh, no, uh, known or reported incidents of uh, killing of outsiders by the uh, by uh, by the tribes and uh, this is uh, the, uh, the this is the uh, uh, this the a brief history of the island then uh, i'll just uh, uh, two points i will make now uh, the anthropologists as well as the administration uh, is uh, has taken a policy that uh, uh, leave them alone or in the in, in the terms of administration it may be uh, hands off and ISO or uh, or it may be a, a, a leave them alone policy but when we take the leave them alone policy uh, there are two things which may discuss one is whether they are demographically when we are keeping them alone in the island without interfering whether it is uh, whether it is demographically a, a sustainable uh, community and second is whether the resource, available resource base is uh, viable for the sustenance. The, uh, when we speak about the demography, uh, there are uh, anthropologists are uh, thinking that the number may be around uh, by um, uh, around 50 to 100. So, but uh, John Allen Chow, his the diary which he handed over to the fisherman, he was telling uh, there are there there may be around 250 islanders there and around 10 people living in uh, each household. Okay, that is his uh, uh, that is personal record in the in the uh, diary he has handed over mentioned about the diary he handed over to the fisherman. But uh, from the observation uh, I made uh, in the 2014 uh, visit, 
we have seen about 16 people of them in the uh, in the on the beach and i think um, they might be in a uh, or belonging to a, a one particular uh, uh, local group and there is a possibility of a few local groups among them and all the 16 were below the age group of 40 and uh, six of them were female and seven uh, uh, male and three were well children we could not identify the them because since it, we are observing from a distance and in that respect i think they are in a very uh, all of them are below 40 and they are in a, the male female ratio is more or less uh, uh, very favorable and the number of children also is uh, very good in that way the demographically uh, they are uh, i think the sustainable the same pattern the, uh, this is only a sample and the same pattern may be uh, may be there in the other groups as well and regarding the resource base uh, the uh, the experts are of the opinion that for a hunting gathering community to survive there should be a land area of about uh, one square mile to uh, 12 square miles considering that uh, the area available in uh, in the island is uh, not much it is only a 16 square kilometer if the number is uh, around uh, 50 to uh, 150 it is not a not a very favorable uh, resource base but the uh, sea surrounding the island is also a part of the resource base of the tribal community but uh, uh, from our observ- personal observation i think there is uh, uh, as of now and from the uh, from the physical features we could observe from the distance there is nothing more to worry about the resource base available and uh, uh, with a, uh, one, uh, one more point i will uh, conclude my talk and uh, Uh, recently uh, anthropological survey of india have prepared a draft a, a, a sort of a, a, a policy that we have uh, published in our journal and uh, that what is to what, what is to be the uh, uh, policies to be uh, under uh, to be followed in the case of the sentinelis in the 21st century and uh, that is uh, the it is our uh, it, it is only a, our uh, uh, our understanding of the tribe of the, on the basis of the Uh, our uh, understanding of that tribe so uh, the last uh, will, the last slide please yeah the in the uh, in that uh, document what we uh, propose is the territorial sovereignty of the uh, the north swan island the territorial and traditional rights on the island should be ensured and the uh, the inhabitants of the island should be protected against the all sort of uh, outsiders and uh, we should build a, a knowledge base on the tribe on the basis of on, on, we have recommended uh, different strategies uh, for this and most importantly because the outsiders the especially the fishermen they are uh, this is the john allen chaus case is not the single case and in, before that also there were many attempts many efforts to go to the uh, uh, sentinel island and uh, uh, but uh, uh, fortunately they put uh, they didn't land there and there were many attempts and then they were uh, uh, with the help of the local fishermen they are trying to visit the island there. so and there is a need to sensitize the local people also thank you very much thank you thank dr kumar uh, you have uh, beautifully given the history of the sentinel islands and a lot of your observations as well others observations also uh, i just want to add one thing that uh, in 1974 also there was one attempt of con- uh, to contact the sentinels was had taken place uh, uh, it was uh, by uh, the films division the director of the films division was a uh, film was uh, mr prem vaidya and the photographer was um, mr mathur and uh, it was accompanied by one internationally known photographer raghubir singh who contributed right. contributed for the life magazine as also national geographic and all and perhaps that was one of the first pictures of the sentinelis that from a distance they had taken because uh, as soon as the tarmugli uh, administration ship you know uh, it was reaching the island they started mock dance and just to frighten away the people not to come to the island and then when they came more near then they started um uh, shooting their arrows and one of the arrows hit the knee of the um, of the um, photographer mr mathur then from port there it was uh, ordered the tarmugli to return without disturbing them 
And the first photograph I remember in the Anthropological Survey of India was taken by Raghubir Singh, and that was displayed for a long, long time um, about the sentinelists. Thank you very much. I don't take much of the time because we have a number of speakers. Next, I will request uh, um, Dr. Umesh Kumar. Uh, his topic he has chosen to speak on understanding, understanding the hunter gatherers of Andaman Islanders. I once again read out his topic on which he has chosen to speak. Understanding the hunter gatherers of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. With these words, Dr. Umesh Kumar, you are pleased. Regarding my topic about understanding the hunter gatherers of Andaman Islands, I, a slight modification I have, I have made after listening, you know, to my predecessors, that a few of them have already spoken. So I will concentrate mainly on the Jarwas now because it will be otherwise repetition of what they have already told why the hunter gatherers of Andaman Islands are uh, so important to anthropologists. Secondly, you know, what are the concerns which bother us? And thirdly, what is expected? So, within these three, uh, you know, the broad uh, uh, points of the framework, I will be, you know, putting uh, the, my, my points uh, for presentation. As elucidated earlier by uh, our uh, respected uh, Aravi Sa, because I'm thankful to him also, because during my posting at Andaman Islands, he was at that time the director, tribal welfare, as well as in different capacity, he was uh, serving in other departments also. And he provided me all possible help as well as log logistic support to carry out the field work among the Jarwas, as well as among the Ongis and uh, other communities of Andaman Islands. So my thanks, my regards to uh, Dr. Auradi also. So now coming to the uh, points, you know, we know that, you know, the Andaman Islands are home to six communities and four of them are, you know, they belong to Negrito Stock. They are the Great Andamanese, the Ongis, the Jarwas, the St. Annelies, you know, and all of them, they inhabit different parts of Andaman Islands. You know. The most important thing about them is that they are one of the oldest population groups in India. They are also the descendants of the first human to migrate out of Africa. And this was established through the DNA studies, first by the Thangaras and later by the Anthropological Survey of India. In the later studies, Anthropological Survey of India also established the fact that the Jarwas, the Ongi, and the Great Andamanis, along with their mainland counterparts, that is Rajbansi, Poribhunya, Munda, Boikasi, and Saura, they belong to N31 lineages about 45,000 years back. It means it was a time period when the Jarwas were also somewhere in the North India. And these Andaman groups, they bifurcated from the mainland groups about 37,000 years back and migrated to Andaman Islands and gave birth to a distinct sub-lineage that is M32. So that, you know, antiquity of these communities make them very, you know, the important from the viewpoint of anthropological studies. Thirdly, <coughs> Coming to the fact that uh, we know that they are hunter gatherers and they are hunter gatherers from the viewpoint of a classical hunter gatherers, you know, until today also two of them, particularly the Ongis, so the Jarwas and the Sentinelis, not the Ongis, the Sentinelis and the Jarwas, they satisfy almost all the criteria of a classical hunter gatherers, meaning by their economy is 100% extraction based. Of course, in case of Jarwa, it was so till 1997. Till date, also to a great extent, it's so. And their social system is an outgrowth of the same. So is their worldview and others. And why am I telling all these things? Because what I feel that 
if we understand the characteristics of a classical hunter gatherers in case of which is there in case of the andaman islands particularly the jarwas and the sentinelis then we will be able to formulate policies or implement policies which is beneficial to them until unless we understand them properly it would be difficult you know to devise some kind of policies which can take care of you know they because nowadays except sentinelis rest of them have come in contact with the you know the outside population particularly the settlers and so it is uh, important so i will briefly you know uh, narrate about you know uh, the what 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 are the few very obvious characteristics of the hunter gatherer communities of the andaman particularly the jarwas you know we know that you know, as or ali sahab was telling that uh, jarwas came in contact in friendly contact in late 1997 and since then they have been in contact <coughs> some of the characteristics which we have observed during our studies which i will not be explaining all those things but only few of them was that you know there are three territorial groups among them they those are goyab kanmad and thidong you know they occupy the south and middle andaman particularly the western part of south and middle andaman islands in south andaman we have the goyab territory in middle andaman we have the two that is thidong and tanmad so the, 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 these are the, the, these are the territorial divisions which we have we have also observed among them we all know i need not to you know, explain it but just to prove my point i am just telling it that you know the consumption of resources most of the resources are immediate in time and space accumulation is very minimum and very least you know tools and techniques used by them for foraging is very simple and here lies the significance that is for satisfactory collection of resources per unit of time you know by using this simple tool set technique that is the bows arrows hand nets it requires a high density of resources for example in order to fish or in order to catch a fish through bow and arrow with the help of bow and arrows you know the density of fish per square meter needs to be very high compared to the fact that when someone is you know fishing with the help of you know the casting net or line and hook so that is that's why we require high density of resources for the survival of these communities in their pristine form thirdly what we found that entire their foraging activities is a function of you know the availability density and seasonality of resources and in the say in all these factors you know the location of huts are very important i am only why i am emphasizing other parts you know i was just giving a miss is that you know while a study a study then since 1997 till 2004 in a span of 7 years what we noticed we have taken you know the you know the uh, jotted down the location of each of their huts whether it was a semi permanent huts or the temporary huts we have taken there you know the longitude latitude course with the help of gps and what we found that they locate their huts at the transition of ecological niche so it was a you know intriguing factor uh, intriguing for us why they are locating their huts always at the transition of two ecological uh, uh, transition of a, uh, of a ecological niche lately we realized that ki by locating their hut at the transition of ecological we say they have the benefit of having access to the resource base of two ecological niche to different ecological niche which has a different suite of resources so that way it provide them a very wide resource base that was that was one thing which we observed during our studies second you know uh, most of us we know that as per the studies conducted by sahalin or 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 the lee or the devor even by the winter harder station scrape so on and so forth we find that normally a hunter gatherer in an ideal situation should not have spent more than 3 to 4 hours a day towards collection of resources you know and when we study we conducted studies among among, among the jarwas you know we found that 
कि वी यूज द टेक्निक्स विच वी यूज वॉज द ऑप्टिमल फॉरिजिंग थियरी देन ऑल्सो वी यूज इनपुट आउटपुट एनालिसिस एज यू हैड बीन यूज बाय द ली एंड then later on you know optimal foraging theory regarding the patch utilization and all used by stephens and crave even to a great extent winter harder has also used it and the result which we got was that normally they are not devoting more than 4 hours a day and in a week they are not devoting more than 3 to 3.5 days in a week towards you know uh, uh, collection of the, their resources it means there are Uh, resource situation is quite satisfactory it, this study has been conducted in 2002 2003 and lately 2004 other result of that study was that you know quite interesting it was that you know they uh, this hunting particularly hunting hunting activities only account for one third of their total foraging activities so it means two third of their activities you know, is oriented towards gathering very important you know that that was the findings and third finding was that of total mandate of work you know only one third of the total male population was engaged in hunting at any given point of time it means two third of the male population at any given point of time were engaged in gathering activities so this was the thing it means the gathering is still the, the major activities but when we convert it then there the diets into you know calories what we find that well of 220 uh, you know uh, out of 2400 kilo calories normally more than 1300 to 1400 kilo calories of their diet it consists of pro- animal protein it means their diet was chiefly rich in animal protein then it also took us to a you know entirely a different kind of debate and the debate that has been was raging in some 90s and early you know 2000 and debate has been by the headland at bailey that tropical forests are poor in carbohydrate resources well our study so that is not poor but we you know still we need you know a lot of further studies to refute his findings that tropical forests are poor in carbohydrate though some of our finding is suggesting that you know jarvas diet is rich in animal protein or almost 1400 kilo calories of the protein uh, you know the kilo calorie they get from the animal protein while only about 1000 or 1100 kilo calories they get from you know the other sources <coughs> you know not animal sources so these these are some of some of the findings so what i mean to say is that Okay, when we conducted the studies it conforms to the fact that the hunter gatherers of andaman islands they they satisfy almost all the criteria of a classical hunter gatherers number 1 number 2 their economy is entirely extraction based economy and the point which needs to be keep in mind that for us it took almost 10000 years to transit from extraction economy to some kind of production economy be it, uh, uh, horticulture or or pastoral economy something like that but when we are doing some kind of development activities or we are making some kind of intervention in case of bizarwas or the ongis or the great endemies somehow you know that fact in the past it was forgotten that if that you know transition will be very slow or they won't be able to you know accommodate themselves they won't be able to learn you know that some of the earlier traits of you know the production economy that's why we failed to teach even the great endemies even the ongis you know even the some of the traits of uh, 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 you know the, uh, uh, the production economy like the horticulture or plantation was done in, into their areas but you know they are they seems less interested they are not ate learned properly they have not that that initial traits of you know the production economy the question is why is it so so that then that needs an entirely different debate we have already worked it i will also be asking uh, explaining it a bit here now uh, coming to the uh, you know having said this 
what are the issues you know uh, which we, we we are confronting this issue which i have just raised i will be doing uh, taking it up was first issue is that you know pertaining to you know such community is that the process of contact with such you know the societies has never been smooth it has has its own advantages and disadvantages disadvantages are more if a human group happens to be a small in size and numbers and practice hunting at the mode of subsistence it has been found that they are being constantly pushed out of their resources as well as livelihood second is that you know uh, we have the example of great and many they know is you know which make very close a uh, parallel in this respect of course they have not been eliminated but their population has decreased alarmingly because of various reasons third is that when such communities come in contact with outfit population three things um, and the first thing was that ki their resources fall prey to outsiders their health suffers on account of their being or getting addicted to alcohol or other you know things and third not only the resources and territory suffer exploitation but they themselves also suffer exploitation in the hand of outsiders so these are the three factors and in case of the jarwas what we have found that you know immediately after being friendly with the outsiders in 1997 in late 2002 we observed that some kind of exchange or very rudimentary kind of barter system has you know come in place between the jarwas and the settlers or between the jarwas and outsiders and a horde of food which was observed by the later studies conducted by amit and others that a horde of terrestrial and aquatic resources are moving out of the jarwa territories in lieu of that what they are getting some rice and other edible items including some of the fancy items this is one this is how you know that territorial resources are getting impacted and dented and second problem of the uh, such communities in andaman island is that their response to change rather than is very slow and secondly uh, uh, besides environmental alteration the transformation in secondly you know besides you know there is a changes in their environmental conditions their transformation also involves an increase in the dependency of the community upon external inputs you know we have the case of saint uh, ongis and uh, saint great and manis the effect of interaction with external system has resulted in lower subsistence diversity as new food items replace traditional ones and a reduced capacity to respond to sign of degradation within the ecosystem as people's dependence upon external input increases so this this we uh, we, we have observed and thirdly is that ki why the changes are slow as i was telling that it took 10000 years for us to shift from you know the extraction based economy to production based economy so what could be the best method the best method could be that we have in in in, in one example is of you know, the champagne here we have champagne are hunter gatherers also and they are hot they have also learned horticultural activities also they are you know they prepare the best pandanus you know the horticultural fields developing them along the line of you know uh, the uh, food production economy following horticulture and pastoral activities much easier while in what uh, lesson which we learn is that where uh, in else also elsewhere also in the world that where the resource base and territories are intact there any kind of intervention has a greater success rate compared to the fact that where the community has been you know disposed of their land where the community has you know lost its resource base in those conditions the success rate is a uh, very less so uh, any 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 kind of you know the policies that should keep in mind uh, already we have a, a very elaborate policy in place in case of the jarwas and in case of other tribes also but you know that has to be put into action otherwise what happens it will be the case of the sariska you know that there were 17 tigers in the, you know on the papers and all tiger diets so we have the policies but you know that because of you know the lack of implementation in two spirits you know we find that we do not get a desired results thank you thank you very much thank you umesh
you have really done a wonderful work on the Chavez and very in-depth study that is. You deserve congratulations and you have been fortunate enough because when I first visited the Lemon Islands in the early 1970s, I too wanted to do work on the Jarvas, but then there was a proverb in Port Blair in those days that you can see a Jarva once in your lifetime, either you kill them or they'll kill you. So naturally I could not go. However, in 1979, yes, Professor Vidasi was one of the members of the Advisory Council of Andaman Nicobar, and there was, uh, Dr. Auradi must be knowing, in 1979 also there was one contact with the Jarvas, and Professor Vidarthi was informed uh, and uh, he took me also to Andaman to study the Jarvas and it was believed that the friendly contact would be possible. We went to the Kadantala Jeti and we waited for two days in Tarmugli uh, ship, uh, but the Jarvas didn't come out. But we entered their temporary um, hearth was there and temporary camp, you know but we could not meet any Jarva. I waited there for 15 days and it was told to the chief commissioner that if at all any contact is done, then they would take me there. Hmm. Unfortunately, I could not. Very later, later, uh, I saw a Jarva in a hospital, you know, uh, at uh, somewhere in Midland Diamond. Uh, so it has very first fortunate those who have worked among the Jarvas because uh, Jarvas were one of the um, um, most uh, hostile those days, you know. That that's what I told you that you could see see a Jarva once in your lifetime. Either you kill them or they will kill you. And I really appreciate those who have worked among the Jarvas, like Dr. Umesh Kumar, and Dr. Auradi, and all. With these works, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Amit. Oh, at the uh, onset, uh, I would like. I am very thankful uh, to the organizer. And the United India Forum and uh, Professor uh, Shohai sir uh, for inviting me to this uh, auspicious gathering. As uh, you know that I have, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, the, and I was uh, somehow privileged that I, uh, being in Anthropological Survey of India, I was posted in Andaman and Nicobar Regional Center for uh, more than seven years, and I was uh, privileged to work among uh, almost all the uh, PVTGs uh, of Andaman and Nicobar, Nicobar Islands. Uh, though my uh, doctoral work is on Jarwas, uh, but I opted to uh, speak on a very little and least studied community, uh, the Shompen. And as uh, the one of the subtopic of the uh, today's uh, seminar was that celebrating World Forestry Day, showcasing symbiotic relationship between human and nature. I thought the Shompen and the human nature interaction or their resource perception uh, will be one of the uh, suitable topic uh, as per today's, uh, today's theme. Uh, so at the onset, I would like to uh, uh, share with all, all of the participants here that uh, Champagne is a very little known and least studied community. And even the ethnographic information we have on Champagne are very scanty. So uh, uh, studying Champagne, Champagne and reaching out the Champagne villages itself is a huge challenge. So uh, as we can see in the screen that uh, the boat uh, in the seashore uh, this is a Kondul boat. Uh, those who, who have worked among the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, they know that the Kondulites, the Kondul people are famous for their boat making structure. But very few people know that the base of the boat or main structure of the boat is always uh, prepared, by, prepared by a champagne and bartered to Kondulites. Uh, the Kondulites or the great Nicobaris, what they do, they do only the ornamental parts. So champagne never get the fame of preparing the boat. So as I was discussing, discussing that Shompen are one of the least studied and little known particularly vulnerable tribal group. They reside in dense tropical forest of Great Nicobar Island. And uh, if my uh, cursor is visible, we know that great in the uh, Andaman and Nicobar archipelago, 
the southernmost island is the great nicobar island and great in great nicobar island island you can see it's a uh, kind of uh, the reconstruction of the images it's a biological hotspot it's a dense uh, the description geographical description you can see it's a dense tropical thorny rainforest the forest is sometime like a wall you cannot penetrate and uh, in a thing the length of the island is about uh, 55 uh, 55 km and breadth is around 43 km maximum breadth and within this periphery uh, there are you can imagine there are two national parks and one biosphere reserve the national parks are campbell bay national park and galathia national park and it combines the great nicobar biosphere reserves so this is the some glimpses of shompen community the interior group the central group of shompen community community on a hunting expedition we can have a, a visual the how these communities are as on date and this is a newly constructed hut of shompen of southern group the they who are also called the kokio group and this is the map of the great nicobar island i just want to share the basics uh, because uh, the great nicobar island and the coast there are two communities uh, traditionally there are two communities earlier the coastal dwellers are the nicobaris all the west coast villages were the nicobaris villages or we can say great nicobaris villages as they are the inhabitant of great nicobar island and the interior forest there are campsites or small small we cannot call it a proper village campsites of shompen because shompens are the semi nomadic uh, tribal community and semi nomadic hunter gatherer so there are inside the forest there are shompen villages or campsites and west coast west coast areas the nicobaris villages it was up to the before the tsunami 2004 so after the tsunami 2004 what happened is all these great nicobaris villages from the west coast and northern kondu side they have been resettled near the uh, campbell bay area which is the he administrative he headquarter of the great nicobar island so uh, as per our uh, recent study uh, as uh, shahis are already described that earlier it was thought that shompen is a homogeneous group but as per uh, the recent study of anthropological survey of india um, we uh, have introduced one project the ethnographic study of shompen from andamana nicobar regional center and we established it that there are four different territorial or geographical groups of shompen each groups having different sub groups also the main groups are the northeastern group the southern group western group and central group and each having sub group the each groups have the within them the they can marry and a negotiation marriage can happen within the group but within the other groups rarely any negotiative marriage is happening and it's by marriage by capture if it is one another group so as uh, we have portrayed in the map that the, these are the northeastern group this is the central group of shompen the western group of shompen and southern group of shompen the ching resettled chingen village there are few shompen families they are from the southern group of shompen so and the, uh, i have already uh, in mentioned about the uh, biological hotspot about the great nicobar island so uh, as in great nicobar island there are two tribal communities traditionally uh, or are from uh, centuries there are there are uh, reciprocally they are reciprocally co coexisting in different parts of great nicobar island from hundred of years and any study on shompen cannot be perceived in isolation why because uh, it must be viewed reciprocally in any historical specific and contextual specific situation why because there is a long term bartering bartered relationship with great nicobaris and shompen and written document is available from the study of e h man in during 1870s when he used to visit the west coast villages he has observed this bartering relation supply of rice uh, from the outside of the chinese people to the nicobaris and inter nicobaris used to supply the rice uh, to the shompen so there is a long historical uh, reciprocity and bartered relationship similarly interestingly there are two contradicting term the samhap and komhap uh, samhap is the term uh, used by nicobaris to refer the shompens 
and uh, all the academician or earlier researchers who visited Shompen, they distorted the terms probably somehow to Shompen. And there is another term, Shompen term, Kom Hop, that is meaning that the coastal dweller, that is the Nicobari. So Shompen are referring the Nicobaris as Kom Hop, and Nicobaris referring the Shompen as a somehow. Uh, moreover, uh, the tragedy of tsunami, it has greatly impacted because the, uh, the bartering arges, because Shompens, they are hunter-gatherer, hunter okay, but their livelihood also dependent on the bartering requirement, bartering arges, as the, all the Nicobaris from West Coast and Northern side have been shifted to the Campbell Bay, there, there is a vacuum in Shompen life for their bartering arges. And they are still coming to the Campbell Bay by walking 30 kilometers are walking two to three days within the dense forest for to meet their bartering arches. So uh, there are uh, earlier studies mean at first uh, the a Danish uh, missionary, uh, the Sir Pastor Rosen have first informed the uh, existence of Shompen in 1831. After that, very few sporadic studies are there. Uh, E.H. Mann, Temple, Claus, and lastly Risby. Uh, these are the few ethnographic and concrete studies, but uh, till ethnographic information and ground information, there is a lack of intense information. Uh, for any level of policy decision also, we do not have sufficient ethnographic information on Shompen. Even uh, till that, we can say after the 75 years of our independence, we don't know the exact population of Shompen. The census 2011 is saying that it's 229. If anybody asks anyone that, please give us the name, age, date, name and age-wise population, no one have. Neither Anthropological Survey of India have, neither the Tribal Affairs, Tribal uh, Department of Andaman Nicobar Administration have the exact name and age of 229 Shompen population. Because the central and western group of Shompen is very difficult to reach and they are somehow not friendly nowadays also to the outsider. Because Shompen who are coming to the Campbell Bay and outside for buttoning edges, they are different people. But when the champagne of the central group, they're in the forest and you are going to approach them, they're different kind of people. Their behavior is entirely different that we faced during our expedition and field work. So uh, as we know that livelihood and uh, resource perception is a very important, uh, important aspect for any kind of administrative interference, any kind of administrative development, development initiative or preparing a policy. So in this uh, discussion, I will uh, briefly talk about, due to lack of time, on the uh, their livelihood activities, primarily including the hunting of wild animals and fishing, uh, food gathering and processing of pandanas fruit, the little bit of horticulture, though it, I feel, I believe that it cannot be termed as uh, the ideal kind of horticulture. So I call it, it's a domestication of plants in a rudimentary form. But because there are only finger count, counted plants and they could cultivate. And also a domestication. It's not a animal husbandry, some people say, but it's a kind of domestication of animals. Only the pigs and dogs and this kind of few finger counted animals have been domesticated. That is also a very rudimentary and crude form. Processing of fundanas food and tarot corn are the two significant traditional such type of food of champagne. Then again, another aspect of livelihood, the honey collection, then the bartering with the great and the, uh, great Nicobaris community. These are the few aspects of livelihood and of, of course the resource perception of the champagne that we will try to uh, discuss. These are the few hunting implements of champagne. Uh, as we know that uh, the you uh, like unlike the Jarowas and all the Negrito tribes of Andaman uh, Islands, champagne do not know the use of bow and arrow. They are particularly dependent on the spears the small spears different arrowhead different length and some more than three meter of length this huge kind of spear some spear may be for hunting a crocodile hunting a wild pig hunting turtle hunting a wild boar and hunting mon monkey etc so there are different kind of sparrow have the different name uh, for hunting of different kind of wild animals so when they are not in use, the, these sparrows are kept uh, suspended or uh, hanging uh, in the ceilings. 
so uh, before uh, a champagne boy with a non traditional dress uh, with a sparrow for uh, hunting a big size wild boar so it's a huge uh, these are uh, detach, uh, detachable sparrows that uh, sometimes used for the hunting of turtle and other aquatic animals so uh, after having the meat of a wild boar the like jarwas also uh, they used to keep the head and mandibles of the uh, wild pig uh, due to some of their animistic belief and as also a hunter's trophy that who has hunted or which group of champagne have hunted how many numbers of wild pigs and they used to keep uh, hanging uh, in the ceilings but jarwa used to keep uh, by weaving with the cane thread but champagne never used this cane thread uh, for weaving this uh, wild boars uh, heads and mandibles some crabs and other resources also they used to collect and hunt in the from the muddy estuary and regions uh, to pursue their livelihood the, these are the fishes collected by champagne of different areas and turtle olive ridley turtle and other turtles also uh, they used to have it's a delicacy for them uh, turtle head also they used to keep as a hunter's trophy these are the egg shells of turtle so during egg laying season Uh, they used to wait, uh, wait nights in the seashores for collecting the turtle egg, and they used to relish uh, the turtle egg. After uh, having this, these uh, egg shells are used for lime preparation also. Uh, the wild pigs uh, are delicacy delicacy for the champions, and uh, they have learned a, a very crude and primitive technique of uh, domesticating or taming these uh, wild pig. What they will do. Uh, while hunting, uh, suppose they got a piglet, a small pig, they will bring it without killing it, and they will prepare a cage like this, and uh, they will keep it for uh, about two weeks to three weeks in that cage and or fencing, and they will feed them. So uh, after feeding them, after two weeks they will live. It's a kind of open rearing. They will live in the forest, though the forest is with lot of wild pig. but this domesticated wild pig will not leave the champen herd by because what they will do uh, they will start feeding these uh, pigs the throughout or the waste of boiled pandanas so they will be, the pigs will be addicted to this boiled pandanas and champen believe that when the pigs are addicted to the boiled pandanas they will not leave the champen village so all the domesticated wild pig are surrounded by the natural wild pig in the forest and they are openly rearing the pigs like this but very few number of pigs are reared by champen now it is they have learned the trapping and the wild pigs or wild boar also they have learned this technique from the ranchi community in the neighbor ranchi mean this oramunda kharia who came in the island as a labor uh, the champen learned the technique of the trapping the wild pigs also one of the more major two major staple food for champagne the traditional staple food are the pandanas fruit and taro corn taro mean the uh, arabi in hindi the colocasia esculenta uh, are the main traditional food so uh, they have started uh, cultivating or these two plants in a very crude and rudimentary form uh, this is the picture of a uh, pandanas pandanas plant with fruit so each fruit sometimes if it is a good variety it may be more than 10 kilo it's a combined food like pineapple and its uh, pith can be collected and uh, consumed and kept uh, for months also so as per champen perception and um, color and maturity they can recognize or they perceive three diff different varieties of pandanas fruit the red variety and they have a uh, their traditional name also the kukaya the white variety the pgn or the yellow variety the pianghao and these are the different varieties of uh, pandanas fruit as per the champen perception and they used to prepare this uh, champen used to prepare this pandanas fruit at first they will separate it they will boil it then they will extract the pith of that uh, and uh, the after that they will collect it and preserve it like this in a manner wrapping with a dry leaf and it can be consumed after months so it's the main delicacy of champen traditional uh, staple food so that uh, as i told that the second uh, domesticated plant of champen is the taro plant 
so taro they used to call it huyev in shompen dialect so uh, this is the this is the kind of uh, root cough or arbi we used to say in hindi they shompen also recognize uh, mainly three different varieties of taro cough based on their color the reddish kind of little reddish kind of taro the makaiye or yellowish have different other name and the white is also have different other name the technology used in this kind of farming of taro is very crude with a digging stick they will dig at first there is a lot of uh, in interesting uh, areas by select and uh, regarding traditional knowledge of the taro cultivation of shompen mean how to select a patch of land then fencing then irrigation and it's a kind of very uh, initial stage of uh, they have learned mean initial stage of uh, horticultural it can be observed among the shompen they used to this kind of fencing with very crude methods with whatever implements they have and for protecting the taro cough for protecting the ta taro cough from the wild pigs and this this is also a introduced uh, chili plant because the nicobar is another uh, department the plantation department they have in introduced the chilies and shompen used to grow for their own consumption and barter also uh, and after that it starts gathering so uh, women are mainly taking part in gathering they used to collect different kind of fruits and firewoods and etc and this kind of firewoods collection we can see, see among the uh, shompen ladies and girls uh, and some medicinal plants and shedding leaves uh, as i was discussing that the preparing of a uh, cano is a shompen art so they are very perfect maker of cano from a tree trunk so and these canoes are there for their own use and also supplying to the nicobaris in uh, the, as a barter item the collection of honey shompen uh, do collect honey for their own consumption but also but mostly for barter because whenever shompen groups and shompen males are coming to the campbell way the nearby uh, uh, administrative center they often will come with the honey for barter and their knowledge is that uh, shompen also do not use smoke uh, with a uh, with a bark of a uh, specific plant they will collect the bark and uh, in a, a tree hole where these uh, uh, bee used to nest they will put the bark and with that smell of bark the bark is working as a bee repellent and they will collect the honey after that uh, notably that there is no stinging bee in great nicobar island so earlier we thought that why they are not using smokes and etc later we found that the apis indica or this kind of stinging bee is not available in great nicobar island only the black small bees honey they are collecting so uh, we can uh, assume the uh, way they are saying till date shompen are doing the fire drill exercise because sometimes they are living in so distant area so dense forest they cannot come the match boxes may be exhausted the match boxes are also one of the barter item so till the young generation also know the fire drill process and they used to make fire with the fire drill and these are the uh, molas molas can viable as a source of protein they used to consume this from the estuarian regions and these uh, shell of the molas uh, are used for lime preparation because shompen are fond of betel nut and betel leaf betel leaf they are growing there in their Uh, campsite areas, and they must need this lime. Lime is processed in a very traditional way by burning this kind of thing, and it's quite common as in everywhere in India and other areas. But just burning the lime, uh, they will prepare the uh, limes. Burning the seashells. So barter relations, as I mentioned, that it's a very important aspect, and as uh, there is a due to short of time, I know that. as per nicobaris there are seven group of shompen in terms of their of their buttering relationship this different buttering relationship with different group of shompen so uh, accordingly there are seven group of shompen as per buttering relationship but as per our study we have clubbed it and uh, and we have suggested that there are four territorial group with different subgroups and for their buttering urges as we have already discussed that all the nicobaris Have been shifted from west coast and northern coast to the Rajiv Nagar, and each shompen group have their buttering Nicobaris partner, 
so for buttering arches they are again coming but walking 30 km for 40 km to the rajiv nagar to those nikobaris of their earlier villages earlier nikobaris villages so their first preference is those nikobaris and they also with butter with other communities as per their desire and they used to they require the cloths rice tobacco and other whatever item they desire the ajbs and andaman administration also systematically supplying the rices to them a quintal of rice a monthly sub, a supply a more than a quintal of rice supplied to each group of shompen by ajbs remarkably uh, two more uh, things uh, we just want to discuss here that uh, when uh, we are preparing any policy uh, one any policy like shompen policy 2015 we have prepared i know that there were some studies but the policy itself sometime create some misunderstanding that one line was there in the po shompen policy that the relationship uh, with the rice and shompen of the, the central group and uh, western group is not established so this single policy single line of the shompen policy create a great uh, misunderstanding among the administrator in the Uh, the assistant commissioner of uh, great nicobar island also what then what to do should we not supply rice to the shompen because through the public distribution system rice was being supplied to the shompen groups and quintals of rice every month so when this kind of line is coming in the policy then should we stop the supply or should we continue it so i think in any policy we, there should not be any ambiguity that uh, this kind of thing because as as shompens are having rice from hundreds of years the written documents are there they are they are fond of rice Ra beside the traditional staple food rice is also one of the main component of uh, component and they are having as a uh, staple food so uh, this kind of ambiguity in policy creates a lot of problem so i think further study is also required to compensate uh, those kind of issues so as i was saying in shompen cognition the natural resources that here i will discuss the resource perception of shompens so uh, as per shompen uh, cognition the natural resources may broadly be classified in three notional categories namely the forest resources the hipai or sea resources resources the gao or the estuarian resources the kagao so these are the three broad categories of uh, resources in shompen perception for livelihood pers uh, pursuit shompen perceive three different areas of sea because sea also a one of the major uh, resource areas the sandy seashore from where they used to collect the turtle eggs and other resources the shallow water major major fishing zone and the deep sea shompen do not uh, adventure to enter into the deep sea because their canoe is small so rarely they went to the deep sea so uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. I'll just I'll just finish within a minute. Uh, so, uh, as uh, as per perception of shompen, they are, they have different names and different group. Three different group of name of the three different group of shompens I have collected. That they have different name for uh, wild pig and domesticated pig. Wild pig is known. The domesticated pig is I. Then different name of the different faunas. So they have what are the terminology of shompen. of different flora and fauna these are the some of the items then their color perception a uh, very interesting thing in their color perception they can they, these are the uh, red what the shompen of laful bay call uh, uh, term for red color or yellow color shompen of uh, chingen village what they call shompen of kokie what they call uh, these are the different terms but most interestingly that uh, when we see uh, we have i have quoted uh, i have shown them the color chart so what we have uh, identified that for green color and blue color blue color they can identify and they have name name for each color the suppose the green yellow green green cyan these all these color they have different names also they have terms also blue also different kind of blue they can identify also they have different terminologies for this blue but for for all variety of red they have one term for all variety of yellow they have only one term then uh, what uh, why why they can identify and they can name uh, these many number of colors 
it's mainly because their resource perception and their livelihood they are always encountered with different shades of green and in the forest and different shades of blues in the uh, sea area so this may, it may be the reason and one very important uh, lastly these are the some uh, photographs uh, of uh, field work during you have to tent in the swamp areas you have to stay there because the areas are not reachable and the very last uh, as a uh, day of forestry i just uh, with a very concluding word i will end here that sometime you, you can see in these area champena and jaro also there are two contradictory laws laws and acts uh, when which one to decide and which one to supersede which one to supersede because as per act uh, regulation 1956 the primitive tribal act that all these champen have the right to hunt any kind of wild animal but at the same time the uh, wildlife protection act 1972 it prohibit them to hunt this endangered animal even you know there is a megapod bird whose number is only 50 and they are existing only in great nicobar and champen used to hunt megapod bird they used to eat, eat the egg of the bird so which act to be superseded the pet regulation the protection of tribal population or the wildlife act so this kind of contradictory regulation i hope it will be everywhere so it is to be sorted out with this few words i am ending here and some field photographs our hard work uh, with the team i will just show and i will this is the dense forest through which you have to trek to go to the champen areas and thank you very much thank you thank you very much for giving me the opportunity thank you dr amit a wonderful work really you people have done um well uh, while we are discussing about the shom pen uh, i would like uh, at the end um because sometime i read that silent silent trade between the shom pen and the great nicobar is also continued sometime long long back number one number two i also try to meet uh, shom pen two times in kambal bay but uh, both the times i could not meet i walked i walked for about say, 10 kilometers inside when i had come to that uh, the shompen had come to um kapal uh, bay and they were returning so i thought that might be meeting you know but then even after 10 kilometers of walk i could not meet them uh, you talked about the rice uh, you know in the whole of the nicobar islands no rice cultivation is done even the nicobarians for more than 400 500 years before they got habituated of rice but they do not produce rice or wheat or anything like that because they are also horticulturists and you talked about the mega pod you know in uh, great nicobar but as far as i have read in, in some anthropological literature and other ways also that uh, tilanchong island which is uninhabited mm, mm, uh, there also the mega pod was found with these words i don't uh, waste my time we have two more speakers you know uh, so uh, dr uh, shri shubhra sankbari you know and then uh, lastly piyush ranjan sahu is there now i'll request him uh, to present his topic of uh, um, presentation is understanding tribal situation of andaman and nicobar islands it is a general one but the sub topic is very interesting a passage between myth and reality once again understanding travel situation of andaman and nicobar islands a passage between myth and reality you are welcome uh, bari thank you good please good evening sir and uh, uh, it's my very proud privilege that i have been invited in the a uh, great show a great academic show and we, i think it is the very inaugural uh, uh, podium of uh, uiaa so my uh, best regards to professor shahya sahab who invited me to be one of the uh, panelists of this uh, gathering and my regards to professor dk behera uh, uh, professor gregory and my uh, uh, colleagues other teachers and delegates so already we have discussed a lot we have learned a lot from the uh, almost the tribal situation tribal affairs uh, on the manipur island and it's uh, almost one kind of journey for 100 <coughs> 100 years more than 100 years 
since uh, this year we have been celebrating the great, great uh, uh, anthropological contribution of our uh, A.R. Radcliffe Brown. And what now I just want to uh, uh, talk some certain things so that I can uh, uh, attend both of the aspects that the myth and the reality. So my uh, and my staying in Port Blair was uh, continuous uh, 14 years, uh, 99 to uh, uh, 99 uh, to, to 99 to uh, 2013. So so during those days and before that, uh, when I landed uh, on Andaman Nicobar Island on 9th of December 1999, I had no such idea about the tribes of Andaman except some literatures which are available uh, in census and some uh, publications of anthropological survey of India. But I was introduced with uh, Jarwa through other media, that is the uh, film media. So I was in this uh, class uh, nine standard. A very popular Bengali film was the Sobhuz Deepay Raja. And it was a very, absolutely very popular film and, uh, uh, based on that. Uh, that uh, story was on that uh, suspense thriller. Of one detective character was one detective, uh, the lame person, and his assistant is his nephew. So they flew to uh, Port Blair, and before that, the entire island was almost uh, described as the treasure island. So very precious metal, maybe very precious elements are always available in Andaman Nicobar Island. That's why. That land is always a target of non-islander for several centuries, and centuries means that uh, we have uh, uh, find some records in that uh, travel of uh, Marco Polo, Nicolo Gandhi, even Batuta, and thereafter so many people, and then British uh, colonizer and administrator. And then the period came when that uh, true sense uh, anthropological research started with. Uh, yeah, that could brown sahab. That, in that uh, 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 film, it was mentioned that two Americans, <laughs> foreigners, they ventured in the Jarwa land in search of a very precise, uh, sorry, a, a very uh, 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 powerful magnetic kind of uh, element the material that can be changed the world within a time and it is under the custody of the Jarwa. So there was the battlefield, it was fought and before that when those uh, two uh, uh, characters, so the, the detective and his assistant entered to the, the Jarwa area. So they, by that time they were uh, provided a lot of information and very uh, important information was the Jarwa saliva is poisonous the most deadly human species on the earth. And it is the documentation or it is the uh, that, uh, novel of 20th century, end of the 20th century. So that is the myth we have been carrying since the period of Marco Polo. And we never thought that Andaman Nicobar Island is also the land of Homo sapiens sapiens, who is the very first group of human civilization of cultural evolution or economic evolution or biological evolution and who have been settling over for last uh, 30 to 40 years uh, uh, since the period of last uh, uh, ice age. Then the Andaman home, you all know what happened, what happened with that uh, uh, the, uh, battle of Great Aberdeen, how they tried their best to protect their uh, or to prevent their land territory against the colonizer from the colonizer and how they face that uh, traitor from one insider who is also the uh, that uh, uh, criminal escape from the uh, custody and takes uh, to uh, hide out uh, the Dudna theory among the Jarwas and ultimately 1859 when the battle of Awardin uh, took place and that fate was ultimately turned into 1863, and that is the very first Pakistan when the administration policy, policy or the administrative policy of Andaman tribe was not the protecting the Aboriginals, made them 
civilized savaging the civilized and the entire process of civilization of quote unquote savage was absolutely deleterious and it proves with the population size within 3 30 years three decades in 1891 when the census came it came that almost 70000 Greater than the Manis and the other uh, uh, negative group of people were there in the uh, continuous uh, chain of island, Andaman Island, who ultimately came into uh, some hundreds of heads. And many diseases uh, they were infested, very communicable diseases. And ultimately, the Greater Andamanis in the uh, post-independent uh, period, their population came nearly about forty-five. So that is the ma major problem. or the tribe of andaman nicobar island in the perspective of the anthropological discussion very fast one they are very small population size their population is not so huge as like other uh, tribal communities of mainland india very popularly known as uh, santhal munda wora gond like that because they have their habitat is the island situation and they are truly what uh, dr umesh sahab my senior colleague told that they are the classical hunter gatherers so whatever they need for their subsistence everything is extracted from the ecology either from marine resource or from mangrove forest or from evergreen forest or for any kind of forest species so they cannot produce so it is the true classical hunter gatherer example of true classical hunter gatherer thus our human uh, that uh, society and the economy evolved so that's why their population size is very limited and with limiting population size it is very tough to compete with the other society those who belong to absolutely different kind of economic pursuits the production based they belong to the need based economy and we belong to the production based subsidy based economy so they extract for need and we extract from greed the surplus that the conflict between two different mode of philosophy economic philosophy ultimately what we want right now what would happen in future because they are the living species that the human sapiens or homo sapiens that the human species they also increase uh, their population for defending the territory for attacking attacking the uh, territory or for management of resource extraction or for division of labor so that their productive unit as well as the reproductive unit could provide them sustenance biologically or genetically on the earth on other hand their area is gradually shrinking because of lot of and different kind of anthro anthropogenic act activities like uh, refugee revitalization policies in several decades lot of uh, 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 ethnic groups from mainland india bengali tamil uh, malayali uh, burmese they came over here and settle settle over very close uh, uh, to uh, uh, tribal reserve and then the strategic importance we cannot ignore the strategic importance of the andaman nicobar island and since the colonial period even before the colonial period that that patch of uh, bengal and the indian ocean was very popular maritime activity it is the very popular maritime route for voyagers from mainland india to south east part of uh, 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 south east uh, 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 part, uh, uh, part of asia from uh, 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 since the period of uh, 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 ashoka and that route always invaded by pirates so the strategic importance cannot be ignored even till uh, one day the government of india cannot ignore 
the importance of the Andaman Nicobar Island as a very important strategic one. Naturally, day by day, so development initiative would be increasing. Now we have to think how that welfare policy to be designed in coming days. Say for example, say for example, the Greater Andaman is. They have marched. They have marginalized with the uh, uh, many years back. So now we have to think about how long they would be remain with the isolated places like uh, Strait Island, or they should be march with the or the streamlining with the uh, uh, development of the entire nations. How long they would be treated as the potential human resource? Whether they would live on dole, food supply, or government welfare policies, or they would live on own honor, own pride, to, ex to display their own skill in different kind of arts, aesthetics, and uh, else. So with that, just uh, due to uh, time constraints, I today end now. Some I hope some other day we'll meet together because the Annaman story is it requires almost I think to my experience seven continuous uninterrupted academic dis discussions. Discussions. You are right. Absolutely. So, uh, Absolutely. It is very short, but uh, I again I uh, convey my regards, uh, my heartfelt thanks to organizer to invite me in such a great occasion. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Barik. It was wonderful to hear you. Uh, we have the last speaker today, uh, Dr. Piyush Ranjan Sahu. Uh, well, you talked about say, Marco Polo hmm, and um, Andaman is home, then Radcliffe Brown's 50 years. I just want one minute only to tell you that Marco Polo, you know, he has written that the Andamanis are like beasts and monsters. Mm, as soon as they see somebody, they cut him into pieces and devour like animals. This sort of um, myth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, this type of myth was there. <clears throat> well, you know, Andaman is home. Um, that is wonderful. I mean, that is that that the seeds of the decline of population of the Andaman of the Andamanese uh, were sown in the Andamanese home. This is my. Uh, feeling I don't have time to explain all these things, you know, because Bra Radcliffe Brown, who worked there from 1906 to 1908, in his book, he has clearly written that he hopes that within 15, 50 years, this population will completely get extinct, you know. And when in 1974, January, I met all the 19 alive Andamanese at Kadam Tala Jetty, once I saw, I have written all these things in my article, writing ethnography, a concern of mind or heart and soul. This is an article mm, which I wrote uh, sometime back, you know, in that I have given the picture that 19 people were alive today. Of course, uh, uh, the population has increased, but uh, everybody knows that that is not a purely genetic um, um, Negrito population, that's a mix of everything, you know. I don't want to take uh, much of your time. And uh, the great uh, the Andamanese, who are sometimes referred to as great Andamanese, who lived in North Andaman, Middle Andaman, and South Andaman, all these three big islands were covered by them. Now they have been, uh, have, they have been um, today living in the Strait Island, as you said, that is hardly 4.5 square kilometers. So a population which uh, lived in so, I mean, and thousands in number in Middle Andaman, North Andaman, South Andaman and all, they are now reduced to the, not only number, but their territory is also reduced to 4.5 kilometer straight island where they have been living now. Anyway, uh, I would like to invite the last speaker, Dr. Piyush. Thank you, sir. My regards and my namaskar to all my teachers and you, sir, because you are also my teacher's very good friend. Uh, so and uh, Deepak Behra sir, Gregory sir, and all uh, Joshi sir, all of you, and uh, KK Misra sir too. 
so this is uh, the topic is uh, an anthropologist experience among the nicobar nicobaris of chowra island uh, of andaman and nicobar island so it's a uh, very interesting because uh, which i am going to deliver uh, this today's uh, our teacher uh, bina uh, bijay shankar sahay sir already have done field work in this island so and uh, we are we all are very fortunate uh, those who are in anthropological survey of india because we got very good experience in all over india uh, including andaman and nicobar island so really we are fortunate and thanks to all the uh, scholars all the seniors from anthropological survey of india and to anthropological survey of india so this is i'm not going to de describe my, myself uh, about me already have done so i am going to directly to my topic that my experience what i have faced what i have experienced in this island so within 15 minutes i have cut it so many things i have cut it down and if you will ask at last questions then i will be able to answer it so again you know that is a very good uh, that is it's a very good experience i have done in uh, jarua that is ang sompen uh, that is uh, all parts of nicobaris all groups of nicobaris and this is particular of chowra nicobaris so because uh, this is a linguistic six linguistic groups are there in nicobaris and this is one linguistic group in chowra so that is i am going to explain so you already have no i am not going to geographical locations everything approximately 1500 population is there the study was in 14 2014 2014 and 13 so that is 300 that time 3 366 households were there so going to the map this tiny small island is called chowra we can see that this is the chowra island so it's a really amazing experience i have got from this uh, uh, islands as, as an anthropologist in anthropological survey of india see everybody called it the truth brass island see it's really looking all the photographs are taken by me in this photographs and uh, what uh, before going to the topic uh, i would like to say in observation is the best methodology in anthropology but i will say uh, from my teacher those who have taught me the participatory observation is the best methodology in anthropology so that i prefer always as a young and as a uh, what you called the uh, uh, anthropologist so this see from the panoramic view of this island is looking like this and this is small hill top is there that is called the uh, tohet uh, that is called the uh, uh, tohet of the island so this is uh, and you already have known that the communication problem is there so there is no good anchorable uh, uh, that is jetty uh, where the ships are anchoring so that's why the ship generally anchor in the sea, middle of the sea far from the uh, shore and we have to get down with the boat and then you have to go to the island see how we are anchoring uh, the ship is anchored and we have uh, uh, downloading our uh, instrument our baggage our field work instruments to the uh, see how dangerous if you will see then you feel and you feel the field work in andaman and nicobar which already have experienced few of uh, these uh, uh, panelists and also the scholars over here and here this is participatory observation every why why is important this is i am uh, just climbing that tree that is dahap dahap is called in chowra that uh, hill is called dahap so that dahap i am climbing and uh, after the climbing of that uh, uh, that hill up, that small hill then i felt that whole uh, that hill is made of that is called uh, that the uh, uh, that is called uh, this is uh, uh the molas molas all the dead molas are there so uh, this is the, this is the uh, hill so uh, that is uh, then come when i felt that is the experience among the jarwas experience is different in the nicobar when i was in jarwa so many experience were there and it is purely difficult different from the nicobar when i was among the jarwa i was so thin in one month i reduced uh 80.8.5 kg and when i uh, worked among the uh, nicobaris then i uh, got uh, uh, weight uh, uh, 10 kg so this is the food habit of the uh, people uh, so this is the then come to the learning of the language i learned whenever we go this is our teacher taught us and everybody knows we learn many languages but here in chowra is very interesting uh, language learning is kopang just i am giving two example one is kopang kopang means bag bag means jhola in hindi so but in their conception kopang means which is not visible 
inside if you keep something inside outside it is not visible this is the concept of bag this is called kapang and like this they are very jolly people and they were they teasing people so they called if somebody is there who is keeping everything in his heart not free to, with others they called this person also kapang so these things very interesting things i got and this is a chunk chunk means fisher man this this uh, you know called the hiran hiran means the bagula which is uh, take the bird which is uh, take the fishes it the fishes so chunk is that uh, hiran but people called the fisher man also chunk so see the uh, words now we are, uh, i am going to prepare one dictionary and already uh, i have prepared that dictionary and this year uh, this 21st i am going to publish it so this is uh, effort and got, got so many uh, help from my colleagues and everybody and uh, people from the island so nomenclature i am not going to everybody knows the nomenclature why these five villages are named uh, changmang koya uh, alhaid tahela uh, koitasuk raihan how it is named so only five villages are there how it is named according to the name which uh, time concentrate is there there before tsunami the villages were located in the coastal but after the tsunami these villages are re relocated uh, in the mid point of the island see this is the tsunami uh, statue how uh, deadly the tsunami was and 86 people uh, were, were died in that island and many houses were destroyed and see this is the mid point of the where the villages were uh, located but still so many people are there those who are residing nearby the coast so this is the uh, thing and these are the very beautiful uh, dome shaped uh, ho uh, houses are there called nihupul nihupul means ni means any kind of houses or sheds or sheds means cattle shed also this is called ni and hubul is the different types of this is dome shed so nihupul then a ni nilyang means ni Uh, sorry uh, the hubul and there are four types of houses are there uh, so these are called uh, so many names are there i am not going to details then social structure few of things i will uh, describe in this social structure uh, that is called family family clan structure economic management system and traditional political system so this is this is the beauty of the chaura island this is really all the nicobaris have this type of beauty that is from uh, from to lower just i am starting you see 12 is there 12 means the total uh one this is five families are there you just see in the last in the lowest uh, st uh, stage that is the houses are there one house the families are there families two members are there every three members family is there four members family is there this is called kamsui common uh, common swim means family small family when joint family is there that is called kamnach this term is called kamnach it's a very interesting and the family head is this joint family head there is every family is had a head that is called joint family head that is alfred is one example i have given from the hungpit there are five clan uh, uh, groups are there and one clan i am going to describe that is called hungpit clan so this clan and this family's head is called kamnach and the kamnach all kamnach went together so the head is called the group is called wav wav and the head is yo wav yo means the head so yo wav means the head of the kamnach then all the waves went together the head is called uh, the captain or group captain that is called hakmak hakmak or but in other islands if you will go Uh, if you will see in the other islands this is called tuhet in karnikobar it is called tuhet and in uh, great nikobar it is called some another name i forget i have collected i have visited all these islands and i have collected the names so the head is called alfred the name of the head is called but why it is, this is people said it, this is political traditional system but i think this is the economic political economic system socio economic system structure and also the political traditional political system why it is called because this two is green you see uh, two green point is there so these are the food minister appointed by the head of the hakma head of the group when because there is no beggar is in the islands because when somebody in the family faced food scarcity he will inform to the head of the family when head of the family faced the food scarcity he will uh, inform to the yo wav then yo wav will inform to the yo hakma then yo hakak will instruct to this food ministers two food ministers are there in every every hakak 
so he will inform then he will provide instruct to the uh, family members those who have land who have food to give the food so this is the things i am not going to detail so many things are including and here the five haknak this is lamuka kamai atanuha takruk and hangpit this five groups are there and the marriage is there uh, so uh, clan group within the clan group marriage divided so this is but still one two cases we have found and the clan group is called tuhet in karnikobar and other places also so see these are the beautiful and the chief persons of the clan this five persons are the these are the seven persons are there and including me these five are the yo hakna five hak five members are there and this person uh, side by me is the chief secretary this is the new political system that is the tribal uh, uh, chief system is there so chieftain is there captain is there secretary is there this is introduced by the government and this is the traditional system those and a very interesting is there still in chaura we we the the main authority are the yo hak hak the traditional hak uh, hak uh, heads are the real head of the island what they will decide still also everybody has to obey that order so i have get the experience and they say they said me whenever you feel hungry you can take banana you can take coconut sir is also ever about that so with that permission with the help of my guide help of my field guide i enjoyed a lot in that island and he is the person this person is the chief captain of the island he is the janathan mr janathan he is the all one head in all over the island so he is the beautiful amazing man and he is the uh, non literate person but see how love he is there he is since a long time he becoming the chief of this island so this is the and uh, another thing is that very important person is the fredrick and another person two persons are there job mr job and fredrick all are the nicobaris names are uh, converted they uh, to the christianity that's why the name are christian names so fredrick is the tamal sahib tamal sahib sahib means season tamal means the predictor who will predict the season who will predict the uh, date of the rituals date of the festivals they are called the tamal sahib two persons are there and it is hereditary if there is no son or something they can adopt with the help of the yo hak hak they will decide who will be the yo, uh, tamal sahib so it's a interesting thing that they have very knowledge they through the stars through the moons through everything they collected the information and the, the economy come to the economy i am not going to it's purely horticulture and no agriculture there according to the soil soil uh, nature nature of the soil because all the coral that hill top was the full of coral uh, coral hill that is not the stone that hill was fully coral so that i have uh, got opportunity to see that coral hill so this is wild uh, potato bananas brinjals some of the uh, imported from this uh, mainland also so this is uh, just we are going to see that is the uh, we remembering the uh, coloring method that is the brownish malinowski of to at strawberry and island has coloring but same thing if you will see in this island this is called according to the chaura language it is called kichut kichut means when they carrying carrying means the pot the mud pot where they were going to sell everything knows i am not going to detail of this thing because it is a big chapter so this when they are selling to islands they are going through their uh, boat canoes so they they called it kichut and uh, in malinowski is called uh, that is called kulari so this is a very beautiful terminology i have collected and thing is that so they are not going to great nicobar due to one incident that is called in uh, uh, cobra island one body has died in chaura cobra island that's why uh, from that time they are not going to great nicobar this i have collected from chaura also and great nicobar also so i am not going to detail see still also few people are making this uh, chaura pot karyang i have uh, uh, pictureized and i have made documentary also on that uh, chaura but few people are there and uh, seasons they have made it four seasons our uh, six seasons that is called kupiang um, asam hai aliloi and oful according to the season the resource they collect the resources and the annual activities are there and the uh, fruits are there and everything the uh, that is saputang this malala alu it was the taboo that if some outsider uh, vegetable will come to the island people will face a lot of problem or will uh, face ill health but after that uh, this they come and uh, this story is there but i am not going to details livestock are there 
like management is there so management in the sense uh, the cocks are there hens are there dog is there sheep is there but nobody will attack any, any anybody any this because if somebody will attack the next day at the same time he will be killed by the uh, nico that chowrite because this is the punishment that's why the dogs are silent in that island and everybody is our friend with each other so this is how the management with the uh, cocks their hens in the due to the attacking of uh, that uh, lizards and uh, snakes like wild boar monitors and use of lemurang lemurang means this a and boro these all are photographed by me but th there is no time that's why i am sorry extremely sorry and there are types of canoes that is fishing canoes name different that is canoe by uh, diving canoes are there kitchut canoes are there so straight this is the fishing canoe that is up missy this is called is up missy so this is called it fishing you see how beautiful how big fish is cast by the length of that size boat so see the fish length of the fish is uh, how much the boat size of boat is the same so uh, for that i have uh, uh, one night i have spent in the sea shore so fish festival is there uh, so this is at the kebab sea you see beautiful kebabs i have enjoyed a lot in the island so this is festival in chowrang there so many festivals are there the main festival is panohonat not means the pig and panohon means the festival so pig festival is there so many rules are there regulations are there and still the folk songs are there existing in that island huge amount of i have recorded and my teacher professor untar prasad has done extreme very good work in the folk songs of banaras that's why i had given him for the uh, uh, elaboration so uh, that and anything and this fish festival is there bhalicha phablach and ranu papanam ranu papanam is a beautiful festival to make the island strong how the system is there how the festival is there this is different thing and you see how they run uh, in uh, the overside the island and how they make the five villages are there, divided the land according to their uh, size then they pray for the strong of this island the system is uh, so uh, vast that's why i am not then called the isi toruk torai holo mane kana festival it's a beautiful and i have enjoyed that festival also this is a huge festival and i will say this is not popular in outside because it's a restricted island is are there so Okay. In two years, three times I have visited to cover the all around the year. That's why I got these pictures. You see the beautiful and amazing. And one canoe festival, I have calculated four lakh thirty nine thousand five hundred they have spent. So and uh, excluding the daily wage laborer of the carpenter. So you see and one hundred more than ten lakhs they are using. I have the calculation and see. and this is the folk songs there are types of folk songs are there the names of the which they will sing in the uh, panohon or will they sing in the canoe festival which is sang in the fish festival this varieties are there and if somebody is angry with you or you have uh, destroy somebody in the pig festival or in this song he will reply to you he will uh, give you with the songs so this is the beautiful he will answer you through the songs this is the beauty and how the share the uh, fruits with the, the clan uh, family and the uh, clan groups and the relatives after this uh, fruits are there only bananas kupiyang uh, and this is household uh, women participation is very uh, women are here uh, women days is also just gone so women participation is beautiful to extract the oil women uh, uh, deliberately work with the pregnant women also work to construct the houses the clan houses the hung pits the hung groups and also the carrion carrion means the pot and also the coconut they, they are feeding to the uh, uh, pig and uh, the uh, this and also the see the i am not going to detail see the 73 years old the chieftain janathan uh, mr janathan he is climbing the coconut and the wonderful thing in the world that is the chaura maximum adult women are maximum means 99% adult women are climbing the tree what is the economy behind it what is the suggest, what is the things behind it what is the causes there are so many things that so see the climbing the trees and the how skilled the traditional knowledge uh, how old women are uh, and this they are teaching the uh, ch grand daughters grand uh, the, this is related to agriculture how the uh, agriculture the pl plucking of the uh, sorry the planting of the bananas planting of the taro so this is the things 
and this is problems this is finished the health still also the en enjoyable things are there but still they are facing lot of problems regarding to health still also there is a, not a doctor in that island just few days back i have uh, made a query and also lack of drinking water in now government has in, uh, installed five uh, new tanks in the five villages but still the tanks are leaking and it is not sufficient for the drinking water that's why we have taken water from uh, the other islands this is non query and the lack of uh, food scarcity is there but people never said the full scarcity because they are accommodated with that uh, environment that's why they with the fruit with the banana they can satisfy themselves but when we will go we can easily then indebtedness indebtedness means that outsider is making business and now that time in 14 14 lakhs indebtedness total island chaura was there but now what happened i don't know still also government is taking but not taking because dedicated officers were not appointed there and avradi sir was very much dedicated and every people knows and the aadhar card uh, ration card still not update and many people are not getting the ration last side this is the water we have taken from the nankori for 7 days then i have uh, Uh, 105 day, 15 days we have done the field work in uh, three stages, and this is the Hulang. Hulang means the friend. This is the Hulang David, my good friend David. He has done very good, wonderful work and helped me. And people called uh, this is called uh, in in uh, mainland. This is called uh, uh, Holchu, but all recoveries are not mm. Holchu. There, are, thank you, uh, sir, and uh, Namaskar, uh, Doctor Piyush. uh i was reminded that exactly 40 years back you visited 13 14 i was in 73 74 in chaura exactly 40 years before what i was surprised to see that the genealogies or the photographs that you showed and the names also they were all christians 40 years back not a single family was converted to christianity the names were all christian names my informants i remember they were names were as such laklalul kamitop kamichut uv etc such were the names of the chaurians you know and uh, i have my book experiencing anthropology in the nicobar archipelago just this january it has been released by the rootledge you know and you will find lots i mean lot of information in those days about the chaur island because i also spent there you know uh, i remember that uh, uh, bhagwanda is there and he must be remembering dilip chakravarti you remember dilip chakravarti hmm. uh, he was in the anthropological survey of india when he learned that i was determined to go to chaura his one question you want to commit suicide or you want to die and a lot of questions you know and how i reached chaura that's a different thing that's a story that can be read in this book you know this book has been dedicated to captain beels captain beels was a an anglo burmese who had a small ship catherina in those days and he dropped me one night at 2 am 2 am one night at chaura you know and uh, in the second chapter i have written details how i landed in chaura you know it's a wonderful thing you know and uh, the the thing that dr sahu presented i was really excited to see that how the changes have taken place one line i have written in my book that the change, I, i went to chaura after 27 years in 2002 and one line i have written in this book that when i saw the changes there after soon then it was as if i was as surprised as rip one winkle rip one winkle is a uh, short story written by irwin washington he wrote in 1891 uh, sorry 1819 he wrote this short story american rip one winkle this has become a phrase that how a shepherd enters into a cave and after 20 years he comes out and the changes that he saw in america he was surprised to see you know but i went there after 27 years and i saw the some some of the changes i know that every speaker today who has said he must not be satisfied with his presentation because because of the time constraint i know everybody even dr shahu can speak hours and hours together about 
Nicobar. If you give me, then probably I'll be engaging six or seven hours speaking about Nicobar or Chaura or even about Andamans. Because Andamans is one of the best laboratories of, for anthropological researches of all branches of anthropology. Not only social culture, anthropology, but biological, linguistic, archaeological, everything. Now, this DNA system, etc., has um, calculated that uh, 30 to 40,000 years back uh, they have started. But then I have um, uh, references of the books that, on the basis of the study of the kitchen midden in uh, Andaman, it is estimated that over 60,000 years before these islands were occupied by this ne Negrito racial stock. So, with these words, uh, this. Uh, uh, is open for discussion. First of all, uh, let me share with all of you that I thoroughly enjoyed this great journey into the mysteries of Andaman and Nicobar. And I think it was a great learning experience today. But you know, like uh, time is very short. But I tell you, Andaman and Nicobar became a kind of a global query when Ellen. John Allen Chow was killed and a lot of debates, I think, took place. And uh, I agree with the, uh, Professor Sahai about the kind of pain he is feeling by looking at the names which have been changed. I think we should look at, when I look at all the presentations, I am look, looking at Andaman Nicobar aborigines with very heavy heart. And I think a lot miserable things have happened with them before the independence of course there are a lot of atrocities and uh, you know the way they were treated by the britishers i think i've been saying in other forums that the people of andaman the aborigines of andamans were the freedom fighters you know the battle of aberdeen is no less than the battle of 1957 so they should be actually uh, they should be considered as the freedom fighters. That is what my view is. But then because they are in a very isolated corner, we are not giving them the due that they deserve. But after independence also, I don't think they have got fair deal from the government of India as well. And I think one of the reason for that is that I think anthropologists were deliberately kept away from the tribal affairs. And that, I think, is a very serious thing. And because of that, that anthropologists were kept away. Maybe anthropologists were not thought. And you had a social welfare department. You had this tribal welfare department, where you had people who did not be trained in anthropology looking after the affairs of the tribes. And they did not have that kind of sensitivities. Now, the time has come when we need to, you know, like at this level of forum, I think we need to intensely debate and discuss and freely discuss and debate about what we really want for these aborigines, what we really want for sentinelists, what we really want for Jarawas. Because I think only anthropologists have an answer to this puzzle. Now, if you look at KISS now, you know, the same thing is happening in the KISS, that there are forces which are trying to malign this model of giving education. And I think that KISS is following an anthropological model where they're not they are giving education to people without any string attached to it. The same thing is, I think, happening. So a larger debate needs to be, you know, uh, I think started at the level of, of course, starting from Andaman, but also joining the KISS, joining what kind of education is to be given to the tribal children, whether the education with a string attached or changing of religion is the only way of uh, uplifting the tribals from the ignorance, or there could be some alternatives as well. So I think we need to very seriously and anthropologically think about the future of Andaman tribals. We have been unfair to them. Let us acknowledge, you know, let us start acknowledging that we have been unfair to them. People who were in thousands and occupying all these Andaman Nicobars are now in a very tiny island and there are very few in numbers, you know, Vijay Sahai has already told about that. So therefore, I think we should also, you know, like be the conscious keeper of this nation especially about what we have been doing to, to people, those who are particularly vulnerable uh, communities of Andaman Nicobar. 
so i don't want to go much but i think today a lot of questions have emerged a lot of questions have come to me and i think we should try systematically thinking about the answers to those questions thank you very much uh yeah. joshi sir thank you for bringing it uh, bring on, bringing out the pathos of doing anthropology and endemics i i i would like to raise this issue with the esteemed scholars who have formed this panel that why there was a total absence of the fact that what joshi sir mentioned correctly even today niti aayog is trying to cut the forest and remove the tribal who hold the positions within great andaman a uh, great nicobar as well as in little andaman but no anthropologist talks about about policy but where is the sensitivity and a sense of passion which is required in term, ter terms of andamans we we have basically used them and left them alone you you are talking about the education we try to do this thing government just hushes up the whole thing and they accuse me of trying to spread nationalism because one of the chapters which was being taught to the jarwas in their own language was that you must protect your forest you have a right to protect your forest from the outsiders i think these are some of the issues which rightly some panelists have said that we need to have more intensive time and a frank blunt discussion on what is the responsibility of the of the of the, the anthropologists i have been a student of soul tax who taught us who was actually t to rat brown that you know there is a responsibility of the anthropologist also to make sure that the future of the group is sustained with the group of the group of people you work with and he called that as an action anthropology anyway thank you for that time which you gave me uh, thank you saha sir and thank you pc joshi ji thanks pandya sir because it was this concern which brought all of us together this evening this is what we wanted to debate this is what we wanted to discuss and we are seriously looking forward to how to strategize for the future uh, this morning's uh, hindu had some very really disturbing news about it and all that my young friends from the survey have been talking about i think if this goes on then those biodiversity parks are going to disappear uh, the unique habitat is going to disappear and we see so much happening in the name of climate change i wonder what's going to happen there to these innocent people whose livelihood has already been taken away whose chances for survival are minimal as joshi ji has just pointed out you've been there for decades uh, i don't know what to do because honestly when i read this morning's hindu i was completely shaken worst is that you know we have all been silent even i with all due respects asi represents on the committee meetings which are held by the administration no voice is raised you know i i i, I think if you have seen that was the question i put to umesh because when mine was alive i do remember some discussion was going on on that front so i don't know what is uh, ns official position at the moment and uh, i am not really sure how strong a voice we are at the moment but let me share it with you some of us will strive for it because we can't let this happen those of us who worked in ecology understand what's going to happen so it's not only the question of survival of these uh, communities it is also a question of survival of our environment our ecology thank you so much another day hopefully we should be able to have a more vigorous discussion on it thanks a lot uh actually uh, i just wanted to add to uh, what professor joshi said that why anthropologists are being kept away from by the government and all these things you know i remember in 1969 i told you earlier jarwa contact was done and we were there i was there with professor vidyarthi well we couldn't meet the jarwas we had to return but then i had talked to the chief commissioner there who was some army man some i'm forgetting his name now but that is very much written in my book also well i told him that in order to befriend the jarwas often they took the andamanis with them who were then only 19 persons alive and all of them were opium and rum etc addict hmm. so i told him that you take the jarwas so uh, it uh, it won't be uh, good because these andaman just to show the racial affinity with them and make them friends mm -hmm. 
Now the reply, reply of the Jarwa, was, reply of the commis chief commissioner was that no, we don't want anthropologists to meddle in our affairs, and we treat the Jarwas as our royal guests. Well, the very next day, I wrote an article in the next uh, in the in the in the, in the uh, and I mean in Port Blair itself, and uh, Bhagwanda must be knowing uh, light of Andaman, light of Andaman. There was a newspaper, you know. I wrote about all these things that, and my I, I still remember the first line that walking along the streets of Port Blair, it is not surprising to find an ongi boy begging for a few coins, and in the name of education, he has learnt only slangs in Hindi, whereas. Crores and crores of rupees were spent for the um, protection of uh, um, the Ongi tribe. And one of the boys, he was begging in the streets of Port Blair. And he used to, he has learned Hindi and slangs, etc. So all these things are there. And when I brought it to the notice of the chief commissioner, what he said was that we don't want the anthropologist to meddle. When I wrote this thing, the very next day, I was virtually by the administration banished from the <laughs> island. Mm. And, but then it did not stop. Even after one year, the statesmen in Calcutta, they published the same news, you know. So all these things are there. And what you said is correct that um, very often the anthropologists are kept away in spite of the fact that from the 1950s, since the 1950s, sometime this anthropological survey of India is there. Okay. Uh, okay because... thank you thank you very much uh, i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, bijayji professor sa for uh, doing the difficult job of moderating a very interesting and informative session and uh, i personally feel that each panelist should have been given at least one hour to speak so with folded hand i beg apology that uh, it was pity that we couldn't provide them enough time to make their uh, wonderful presentation but definitely what Professor Joshi, Professor Meta, Professor Vishwajit Pandya have raised, you know, the question that uh, discussion must continue in the forum. And our forum should be proactive and uh, try to, you know, provide alternatives what has uh, uh, been planned for the Ireland at the moment. And uh, uh, that, that discussion should continue. And I request each of the panelists to submit their presentation and uh, we would be very happy to upload those to our website and uh, i suggest professor Sai to think about a special issue of uh, oriental anthropologist where all this paper can be accommodated and uh, uh, you invite a couple of people from the forum and they will do the guest editing they will be the guest editor and uh, if that can be published in the name of forum that would be a remarkable contribution to up uh, the forum to uh, Indian anthropologists and anthropologists across the globe. Uh, this is a much debated topic, and uh, I know you know it is now 9:30 and still 60, you know, uh, around 60 participants are there. This is a bit unusual, so that shows uh, you know uh, the I mean uh, uh, importance of this session. And I'm sure this will inspire and motivate our boarding anthropologists to undertake original research uh, in the Ireland. And, uh, you know, our uh, today we are collaborating with uh, uh, the Department of Anthropology, Lucknow University. Uh, I will fail in my DP if I don't invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kea Pandey, even if five minutes presentation, because we are collaborating with the department. And uh, you know, we, I, I don't want to be unfair if she is there. She couldn't join us for technical reason. May I request Dr. Kapp and, uh, and I request all of you to encourage, uh, if she is there, let us uh, spend 5-10 minutes time and let us uh, allow her to make the presentation because uh, UIF has been collaborating with many departments and today we are collaborating with the Department of uh, Anthropology, Lucknow University. If she is there, uh, Dr. Kapp and yeah. Well, uh, regarding some of the questions which have been raised by Professor Pandya, let me give some clarifications, you know. When already, you know, uh, uh, the people have written an obituary on the Great Andamanese, you know. I think after 2002 or three or four, no further research was being done by any of the anthropologists. 
subsequent to it in 2019 a detailed study was carried out by anthropological survey india pertaining to your health and what kind of policy should be followed and a detailed report pertaining to it was submitted to andaman and nicobar administration in 2019 and and also a kind of you know draft policy we have you know uh, published in our 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 journals secondly so far as the jarvas and uh, are concerned you know when we were carrying out the study the, it, we had a two pronged approach one was that was for pure research purpose other was whether it has any applied value or not and the best thing was that when a medical intervention was made and because of that you know the infant mortality rate came down significantly and population of the jar was doubled from 265 to 555 in less than you know uh, two decades then we sounded the alarm in one of the meetings to the administration that we need to see the consequences of medical intervention also because soon a time will come within 10 years when the carrying capacity of the land will reach so it's not that we are we were keeping silent all the time has been told by the pandya sahab thirdly in some of the meetings you know we have time and again and my arabi sahab is there we have told the andaman administrations including Look, Omesh, nobody is saying that you have been silent. The point was about the new policy of Niti Aayog, for which you have been silent. Please do not mix the issue and do not blame me unnecessarily. Let me go first. Let me finish first. Then wrong information and wrong understanding. This is the problem. No, no, not problem, sir. Let me tell because you are making a personal issue. I am saying that we need to address the Niti Aayog, which is interfering with the process. Uh, allow him to complete, then uh, you'll be given time. Yeah, please, Umezi. And time and again, we have also, uh, in fact, because of that, only the then Secretary Tribal Welfare and Money Quenway Station, and eh, they had asked us to submit our reports, which we had submitted. Thirdly, we had also asked Andaman Administration that whenever there is a general meetings, the Director Anthropological Service of India should be called because at times. Those who are posting in Andaman Nicobar Islands, they are the fresh to the Andaman Islands. They may not be able to speak. Unfortunately, in most of the meetings, we are not informed. Only they are called. So that's why these are there are some lacunas, you know, which we need to rectify for the betterment of the Andaman tribe. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Pandya. Would you like to respond? Uh, thank you very much. The, the ASI is always invited at all the meetings because I am present there, and I made it a point that ASI should be taken into a thing because they are stakeholders, intellectually or philosophically. And in fact, your pe the existing person who is heading the office there was there at the last meeting. It's in the minutes recorded, and nothing was raised about the issue of the ungis being taken away uh, and the area being cordoned off for the name of tourism. The, the, everybody was silent. Why wasn't the voice raised? You know, and Umesh ji, I'm not accusing ASI. I am saying we, as a role of anthropologists, have to be constantly involved with the government to say that you're not going to go. Environment ke issue ko leke, mining ke issue ko leke, Odisha mein kitna bada consciousness hua hai. Pani ko leke, Narmada mein kitna bada awareness hua hai. Usme kai log involved hai, kai academicians hai, kai social scientists hai. Lekin Andaman ek aisi jagah hai that it remains a very mythical. And a very exotic place. We don't want to see beyond that. In you know, the physicality of the presence of the body is not one is the, not the only determinant. The mind of the, the the people who live there also is important, and the mind of the bureaucrat has to be trained for this. It is what Krakhun and called as the manipulation of the ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bela sir, may I raise one point? Sir, raise. Okay, okay, okay. Tell me, Professor. I am just saying what I am trying to say. is that look when vinay was there as a director otherwise asi was a lost child it had no director for a long time that shows the priority of the government of india because it is in the ministry of culture and one of the very small department ministry of culture doesn't make sense to the bureaucrats only when vinay was there for a brief time then he started actively involving we saw some kind of policy coming from asi but largely on a, on the whole asi has been a I I don't know, you know, like whom to blame. I think we are all to be blamed for that. The forum should actually now try to speak. What Pandya Sahib is raising the issue is very important to Niti Aayog. You know, 
they are now again trying to make it a kind of hong kong you know they they have, they have hong kong in mind they want to create hong kong there of course do you create hong kong there but at the cost we are talking of cost what is the cost to it and what the cost and why the cost should always be borne by the aborigines why the cost to be borne by the great andamanis and the and the onge that is the question that we must ask we are not against anybody but we are for as anthropologists we are for the the so called vulnerable communities we have always been whether they are shul caste they are shul tribes they are marginalized they are lgbts we have we will always we have been always we will always be with them we with them uh, professor joshi saab uh, i i would like to respond just a minute uh, rightly said by you uh, this cost you know and uh, economics they made cost benefit analysis at the macro level but we anthropologists make the cost benefit analysis at the micro level if i am paying a cost in hard way i am going to be benefited by the so called development project so that is not done and if it is projected at the macro level you will get a very glamorous picture so development takes place at the cost of under development if you want to develop andaman by launching some new project you perpetuate backwardness among the you know pvtg is there the aboriginal tribes that's the whole idea and anyway you know very interesting debate i think uh, all of you have raised interesting question and uh, we should continue the debate and uh, the forum i'll give right... a small ethnographic yeah. snippet for joshi yeah, sahab and uh, dr behar yeah. you know i was part of the niti ayog to be co-opted into making policies of whether this new changes in tourism ka kiya ja sakta ki nahi and i had resisted it at which the one of the person in the niti ayog who was representing in port blair he said ki ye shopping jo hai ye homo sapiens hain this is the level of what a is officer talks to and then when i raised the issue ki aap jahan great nikobar mein ye transshipment area bana rahe hain uski wajah se aapne compare ports already hain and compete in terms of the pricing he said ye aap iski jidda mat kijiye so you know they think we are ignorant people they had no idea that red palm oil is a useless crop and already parts of little andaman are lying wasted because of that idea but they don't want to touch that because wo problem kaun saaf karega tourist log jo hain coastal area mein jayenge wahan pe resort banaiye underwater resort banaiye film city banaiye wahan phone nahi chalta hai kam bakhat dawa ki dukaan nahi hai लेकिन ये लोग रिस्पॉन्ट बना रहे हैं वहां पे शर्म आनी चाहिए इन लोगों को डिबेट इज डिबेट इज वेलकम बट नो आई थिंक वी शुड ऑल्सो बी केयरफुल अबाउट द लैंग्वेज एंड आई थिंक एनफ इज एनफ वी अंडरस्टैंड वर दिस टू बिंचेस एंड आई थिंक Uh, we should carry forward the discussion and we will have a separate session and uh, definitely uh, i ex- i hope that uh, uif would be very proactive and uh, you know will uh, send uh, some uh, messages to uh, the niti ayog and uh, the people who are in the helms of fr uh, expressing our concern and we will write a letter to on behalf of uif will We definitely express our concern and write a letter to uh, the concerned person at the central government. And now I think it is high time uh, when uh, I would like to invite Professor Grigori to propose a vote of thanks and wind up this session. Professor Grigori. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bhaira. Uh, I'm sure that we can I mean, confidently say that we had a very wonderful session. In fact, to join with Professor Joshi. the every one of us who are here has thoroughly enjoyed the session and it was uh, thoroughly experience based um, as professor bagra pointed out um, it's very um, unfortunate that we have to accommodate so many people but we are living in an era where we want to have capacity <coughs> every one of them had very in depth experience but we want to hear from their in depth experience something that would enlighten us if we join all the experiences together we could get a glimpse of what the andaman islanders are after 
uh, Radcliffe Brown studied about 100 years before uh, and published his famous uh, classical work, Andaman Islanders. Um, thank you very much for, e I mean, I have to thank each and every one of the panelists, uh, starting from uh, C.S.A. Avanti, Dr. M. Sashi Kumar, Dr. Umesh Kumar, Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh, Sri S.S. Barik, Dr. Pius Asahu, for your wonderful experience and in-depth analysis. I am sure that uh, Professor uh, Vijay Sahai would take the initiative of compiling this and bring out a special volume as Professor Bagara suggested on Andaman Island. And we are I mean, very grateful to every one of us for having saved their time. But we regret that we couldn't uh, do justice to you by uh, giving very just uh, as uh, uh, Professor said, we, we are all concerned with the, the, the concern you have expressed, sir. We are surely have another session with your input and a debate on the great concerns that we are debating on. And the other anthropologists would definitely have to raise their voice uh, on this uh, important issue and bring to the government's attention and uh, help in the policy making uh, process to do justice to the indigenous communities, in not only in Andaman Island, everywhere in India and elsewhere. Thank you very much. And I should also thank Professor Vijay Sagai, who said that he, he said that he would not like to be a moderator hereafter. But I know the difficulty in, in I mean, doing this great job. Uh, but you did did very well, and we could I mean, enjoy in spite of the uh, the prolongation of the time. We could enjoy each and every bit of the moment. Thank you very much, Professor Sagai, with your own experience. And with your, with your anecdotes, you had made the entire session very interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Sai, for your uh, you. wonderful you. moderation of this session. Thank you. Um, uh, we are very unfortunate that we couldn't hear uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pan, I mean, uh, Kaya Pandey uh, about the department. So those started sharing. I am sure that we will give another day an opportunity for you to share uh, uh, the. the, the file of the department which is very important and Lucknow University, the department of anthropology in Lucknow University is well known and it has contributed a lot to the anthropological knowledge. We want to hear the profile. I am sure that we will give another chance to Dr. Kaya Pandey to share the profile uh, in the coming sessions. Um, I should also thank all those who have been present, I mean so patiently present today, our senior uh, uh, members of the forum and others, the, starting from Professor Ajit Singh, Professor Ota, uh, Professor uh, Anand Singh. I saw Anand Singh present here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Anand Singh, uh, Professor A.K. Sinha, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Lamba, Professor Indu Talwar, Dr. Jesaratnam, Professor Nita Mewar, Professor Amita Pandey, Professor Raheem Mondal, Professor Rajesh Patnaik, Professor Bhagavan Rai, Professor Vijay Prakash, um, you have taken so much effort to be here to participate, though we could not, I mean, uh, have time to uh, have a long interact session, but we are sure that we will have another day devote, fully devoted for this particular um, uh, issue, and we will have a wonderful session on another day. And we promise that the forum will take it, uh, take, it this, take this point. Uh, I should also, I mean, this is uh, today being the World Forestry Day and celebrating the 100th year of the publication of Andaman Island. This is very apt day to discuss on the Andaman Islanders. Uh, so, thank you very much once again. And I would like to uh, bring to the attention of the forum, uh, I mean, the participants here, that we are going to have an important national webinar uh, on changing contours of indigenous knowledge among the tribal communities of India and this webinar is being organized uh, organized by the Federal Cost and Federal Tax Research and Training Institute at TRI Odisha uh, with the financial support of the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, Government of India and United Indian Anthropology Forum is the collaborator of this uh, national webinar 
is going to be held from 24th to 26th, three days. It will start around 10 o'clock and it will go up to noon. So I would like to invite all the participants here and others to uh, participate in this important webinar on indigenous uh, knowledge and make the webinar a success. And we are also we also plan to have a webinar on 22nd, but now it has been postponed to, to 30th uh, March. That will be on anthropological impact in policy formulation, impact and implications. Some of the concerns that we are being expressing today would get reflected in that webinar. So I would uh, like to invite all the participants here to be a part of that webinar too on 30th March uh, 2021. I would also like to remind, remind the uh, participants here that we are on the membership drive. The forum uh, has to uh, become a voice of Indian anthropological fraternity. We are, we are very much concerned with some of the concerns raised uh, here. And also there are several issues that we need to uh, take up. So we have to strengthen this forum. We would like to have uh, more members and every anthropologist and even the students who are uh, doing their anthropology could become uh, provisional members of the forum. Please encourage and we are having this membership drive um, with half, I mean, half rate uh, of uh, subscription rate uh, till 31st March. Please uh, enroll yourself and encourage others also to enroll. Uh, into the membership uh, of the uh, forum. So thank you very much. Uh, I should also thank the technical team, particularly Dr. Nivedida and uh, Dr. Sampriti, who had managed and who had helped in conducting this webinar uh, successfully. Thank you very much. So I think, uh, you know, even if it is late, uh, let us uh, encourage, you know, sometime if you sp spend five minutes time, even if it is now uh, Professor uh, Grigory is proposing vote of thanks. I would like to request uh, him to stop and uh, five minutes symbolically if uh, Dr. K. Pandey will make a presentation. Uh, the anthropology department of uh, the University of Lucknow, uh, as you all know, has always been a creator of new ideas. And there are many first connected with the department of which a large number date from Professor Majumdar's times. One such initiative spearheaded by Professor Majumdar was the Cornell Lucknow research project that was set up under an MOU between Cornell University and Lucknow University and financed by the Ford Foundation. It was signed by Professor Maurice Oakler and Professor D. N. Majumdar as fellow joint directors. It not only drew a large number of graduate students from Cornell to the department, but also provided an incentive to Indian scholars like Professor S. C. Dube to undertake and encourage village studies in India and specifically in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, the creation of a dedicated band of student scholars to undertake studies in this little explore area of research was also a great service by Professor Majumdar. His caste and communications in an Indian village presents a model of an anthropological village study. It was the first anthropological village study in India. So, Professor Majumdar also established a research set of the Indian Council of Medical Research within the Department of Anthropology. A multidisciplinary team of doctors, physical anthropologists, and statisticians used to collect vast amounts of uh, data for varied research projects, including those aimed at examining the problems of physical growth among children in Uttar Pradesh. The contribution of the Department of Anthropology can also be seen in the setting up of the thriving ethnographic and folk culture society in Lucknow, aimed at collecting ethnographic data on the local cultures of rural Uttar Pradesh. It is also a byproduct of the extensive research activities carried out in the department under the aegis of the society. The prestigious quarterly Eastern Anthropologist was also started by Professor Majumdar. Now, during his steward stewardship of the anthropology department at Lucknow University, Professor Majumdar groomed a whole host of juniors and students, many of whom became very known in their very well known in their own right. His junior colleagues and excellent scholars, Professor D.K. Sain and Professor K.S. Mathur, headed the department immediately after him. Professor S.C. E. Dubey, who had also taught under the headship of Professor Majumdar and improved upon his anthropological readings through interactions with the latter, went on to teach at Usmania, Suas, and Saga University. A stalwart of Indian anthropology, Professor T.N. Madan, 
went on from Lucknow University and after adorning many high positions, having taught us taught as visiting professor of anthropology and history of religion at Harvard, has also raised the position of professor emeritus of sociology at the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi University. Another junior colleague of his was the formidable Professor Gopal Sharan, a doctoral student of Koda Du Bois, under whom I was fortunate to have studied decades later from 1991 to 1996, both at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Professor L.P. Vidyati was one of his best students, we all know him, who went on to obtain a doctorate from Chicago. Among other students of Professor Dean Majumdar, who became notable anthropologist for Professor Aris Gore, who went on to Pune and later became a professor at Columbia and Berkeley. Professor N.S. Reddy, his colleague at ICMI unit at Lucknow, who taught later at Madras University and Andhra University, Vishakhapatna. Professor Riku Daman Singh, who later went on to Canada. Professor R.P. Shivasu, who joined Pune University. Professor V.N. Mishra, who joined the Deccan College in Pune. Professor R.K. Jain, who chaired the Center for Study of Social Systems in JNU. Professor J.S. Bhandari, who went to Delhi University, Professor T.N. Pandey, who taught at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Professor Aris Kare, who went on to teach at the universities of Wisconsin and Virginia. The contribution of these and many other reputed scholars who were trained in the department led to the formation of what some refer to as the Lucknow School of Anthropology. Even after Professor Majumdar, the department has been fortunate to have been blessed with heads, all of whom have contributed towards raising its stature academically. In his brief tenure, Professor D.K. Sain and Professor K.S. Mathur carried forward the glorious legacy of Professor Majumdar. Professor K.S. Mathur established a departmental journal titled Research Bulletin. For some reasons, its publication ceased for a few years and was revived by Professor Nadeem Asnan in 2013 with a new name, Anthropological Bulletin. It has kept on publishing articles by anthropologists of repute. It was a part of the UGC care list of approved journals, and I have had the proud privilege of having been its editor since 2013. It is in the process of being included in the UGC care list again. And I take this opportunity to request all of you to please subscribe to it. It is easily available on the Lucknow University website. During his headship, Professor Gopal Sharan focused a lot on theoretical and methodological approaches. And following the path shown by Professor Majumdar, Professor Sharon also spread, stressed upon rigorous fieldwork techniques. His interest in linguistic anthropology and the close attention he paid to theory resulted in the department rising to great heights. Professor Gopal Sharan's impact was clearly visible in the quality of publications during his tenure. Professor B.R.K. Shukla, during his tenure his, as head, developed the physical anthropology portion especially the anthropometric and serological labs. He brought in several World Bank funded projects to the department. He started the practice of sending younger colleagues to various conferences like the Indian Science Congress, thereby giving them much needed exposure. His contributions to the field, especially physical anthropology, are well documented. Then Professor Ranbir Singh and Professor Krishna Kantu have contributed in their own ways to the stature of the department. In another initiative, under the headship of Professor Indu Sahai, the department has got a Majumda Endowment Fund established with a grant of Rs. 25 lakhs from the government of Uttar Pradesh and the department organizes annual lectures and workshops under its auspices. In a step of far-reaching consequence, Professor Sahai successfully persuaded the government to start anthropology as a subject in the UP board examinations also. Anthropology uh, has always been one of the favorite subjects among the students coming to study at Lucknow University. And currently about 500 students are enrolled in various courses being taught here. Besides running both PG and UG courses and a regular PhD program, a part-time PhD program in anthropology has also been started from this year. It was under the headship of Professor Chitlekha Verma that a PG Diploma in Forensic Science and Self-Financing mode was started in the department. Later on, Professor Yuthi Singh contributed towards a gradation of this diploma to a full-fledged postgraduate degree. The department is now well-equipped with modern teaching and research aids. Professor A.P. Singh ensured the extensive use of office automation technologies and computers in the department. Recognizing the research capabilities of the department, the government of Uttar Pradesh started sanctioning the Center of Excellence projects for the department 
starting from the tenure of Professor Nadim Hasnan as the head of the department. Recently, the government of UP has sanctioned a large center of excellence project with me as its coordinator. This project is aimed at the crucial Nexel affected areas of the state. Under its ages, the ethnographies of tribes newly included in the list of scheduled tribes are being written. The department has well-developed infrastructure in terms of museums and a library too. The first museum was conceptualized by Professor D.N. Majunda and collections kept on growing over the years. The museum currently boasts of more than 1,000 artifacts and bears the name of Professor K.S. Mathur, who succeeded him as head and who greatly enriched it. You all would be happy to know that with my efforts, a second museum is being set up with financial aid by the government of Uttar Pradesh, meant exclusively for tribes of Uttar Pradesh. It is the first such museum of the state and is being established in the department is a matter of honor for us. Our departmental library is also well stocked and has a collection of more than 2,500 books. It has been further enriched by the personal collections of most of the stalwarts who have graced this department. I'm happy to share that as a part of the research initiatives of the department, I have also had the honor of being the first person in the university to be associated with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded project, where I worked as co-project investigator on the health of children in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Under the guidance of Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Alo Kumar Rai, various student-centric in initiatives are being run in the department. Under the OPD schemes, students can seek guidance from teachers, both for the academic as well as personal problems. There is a mentor mentee program being run by the department as well, in which, in which each student is attached to the mentor in order to provide hand holding to students during the most crucial years of their life. A placement cell is functional in the department, which works in close coordination with the university level placement cell. This Lucknow school is alive and thriving. Its members are still making their presence felt in various institutions of which they are a part and whose names I cannot be due to shortage of time. Lastly, having conducted fieldwork in Andamans myself and seeing the challenges involved at close quarters, I salute the spirit of Professor Edgar Brown, whose path breaking civil sedentary air, centenary air has brought us all together in this colloquium. On behalf of the Department of Anthropology, University of Lucknow, I wish this colloquium a grand success. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. K. Pandey, for uh, nicely presenting the academic profile of your department. Uh, uh, without your presentation, this uh, colloquium would have been, uh, how should I put it? I mean, uh, completely incomplete. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, we didn't, uh, we couldn't offer you the platform uh, at the right point of time. Uh, and uh, I, on behalf of the forum, beg apology. And uh, that is the negative side of the high tech. Uh, I was also one of the victims today, you know, uh, at the beginning. And uh, now, you know, a very unusual manner. Again, I would like to request uh, Professor Gregory to pitch in and uh, complete, uh, you know, uh, propose the vote of thanks, especially uh, to the coordinator of uh, the Department of Anthropology of uh, uh, Lucknow University, Professor Gregory. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bara. And uh, I mean, I have uh, I have to thank Dr. Kaya Pandey for having come in at, at least at the last moment and uh, presented an excellent picture of what Lucknow University stands for. And we are all proud of Lucknow University, uh, the Department of Anthropology. I mean, we are proud of all the anthropologists who have emerged from the Department of Anthropology, Lucknow, Lucknow University. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kaya Pandey for your excellent presentation. Uh, thanks, Professor Grigory. You know, all the all, all the time you do the thankless job of proposing vote of thanks. So I do the job and I thank you for <laughs>